Assalamu alaikum and greetings from the Islamic Development Bank headquarters in Jeddah. Welcome to all of our speakers and guests joining us in this webinar series on digital development and e-governance. My name is Ahmed Farouk Dikan, Senior Technical Cooperation Coordinator at the Islamic Development Bank, and I will be your MC during this event. Today's webinar is entitled Effective Public Service Delivery and E-Governance, the case of Azerbaijan, and it is co-organized with the State Agency for Public Services and Social Innovations of the Republic of Azerbaijan, the Asian Development Bank, and the Karak Institute. Our webinar today will consist of sessions delivered by experts from our partner institutions, providing regional as well as country perspective from Azerbaijan on digitalization, public service delivery and support to small and medium enterprises through digital platforms. During the webinar, you will be able to ask your questions from the Q&A box, which the, which the moderators will pose to the speakers after they deliver their presentations. We are providing simultaneous interpretation from Russian to English, as well as from English to Russian, which you can access by clicking the globe icon on the bottom right corner of your screen. With this, I would like to now turn over to our esteemed speakers for their welcoming remarks, starting with Brother Enes Isami, the Acting Chief Operations Officer at the Islamic Development Bank. Brother Enes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ahmed Farouk. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mr. Jehan Salmanov, the Deputy Chair of State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations, and His Excellency the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Mr. Andir Tamerla Tagir, Honorable Islamic Development Bank Executive Director, Mr. Sayed Shakil Shah, Director, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, CAREC Institute, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to warmly welcome all participants to the Digital Development and E-Governance webinar that showcases the successful experience of Azerbaijan in effective public service delivery. This event provides an opportunity for participants from the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to learn about best practices in digital development and e-governance and to build on their own experience. We are all witnessing an, an unprecedented global challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which disrupted our daily lives. Lockdowns forced us to learn new ways of uh, working virtually to ensure continuity of services to member states. Schools also had uh, to adapt to offer online education. Unfortunately, the, the disruption also exasperated as well has increased awareness about the digital divide. Uh, E-governance solutions uh, became instrumental for governments to continue providing essential services. COVID-19 made us uh, all realize and appreciate the untapped potential of digital technologies to efficiently provide services, generate employment opportunities, reduce poverty and inequality, develop smart cities and create sustainable communities. The uh, adoption of the digital technologies does not occur automatically. Uh, availability of technologies is necessary, but uh, of course not uh, sufficient. There are other critical elements as well uh, to tap full benefits of the digital development countries need to not only make the necessary infrastructure investment, but also initiate institutional reforms, update legislation and conduct capacity building and awareness raising activities. The program of today's webinar is very rich and covers most important dimensions of establishing a 
an efficient e-governance system. We have a prominent speakers from the State Agency for Public Services and Social Innovation of the Republic of Azerbaijan, which runs the ASAL, Khidmat, e-government services. Today, we will learn about their operational model and good practices for electronic public service delivery, digitalization, promoting innovation, supporting startups and SME development. I would also like to express my appreciation to speakers from our partner organizations, the Asian Development Bank and CAREC Institute for joining today's event. They have been uh, most generous in agreeing to share their significant experience in promoting digital development and e-governance. Islamic Development Bank is fully committed to continue working with trusted partners in this and related areas to support inclusive and sustainable development of our member countries. This webinar is a, a first of series and will be followed by a, a technical session next week between SAPSI and the authorities concerned in the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to understand capacity development needs of the respective countries in digital. In digital development and e-governance. Based on the outcome of our discussion, a potential reverse linkage intervention may potentially be formulated for recipient countries to benefit from the experience of Azerbaijan through a South South cooperation, inshallah. I wish you a very fruitful, productive and engaging webinar. And I'm confident that digital transformation can help Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic stronger, resilient, and more competitive. In these efforts, Islamic Development Bank and other development partners offer their support and look forward to seeing this vision to become a reality soon, inshallah. I thank you for your audience. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Enes, uh, for your welcoming remarks. Uh, and now uh, we would like to call on Mr. Jehun Salmanov, uh, the Deputy Chairman, State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, to deliver uh, his welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anas Alsami, uh, Mr. Tamerlan Tagiev. Mr. Shakil Shah, honorable speakers, distinguished audience, dear participants, uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to welcome and address the audience today on this important theme of public service delivery and e governance, the case of Azerbaijan. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Islamic Development Fund for initiating and co-organizing this event on such a uh, most worship topic. We are also grateful to ASEAN Development Bank and its Direct Institute for their valuable partnership on these webinars. Uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan joined ISB uh, in July 1992 after gaining the independence. Up until now, more than 70 projects have been implemented within the framework of Azerbaijan ISDB Corporation, a couple of them being still in the implementation process. In general, a remarkable amount of funding has been allocated to Azerbaijan during the past three decades to carry out the projects. Uh, the State Agency for Public Services and Social Innovations under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan has established strong bilateral relations with ISDB uh, we have started our correspondence for a period of almost a year, and during this time, multiple meetings have been held to discuss the upcoming big projects. But this webinar uh, is being one of them. Uh, I should also highlight the uh, memorandum of understanding is planned to be signed between SAPSI and ISDB within the next few months, which will uh, further strengthen the existing partnership that we have right now. I'd like to also mention that SAPSI has strong cooperation with the HN Development Bank, and right now we have two ongoing mutual projects. Projects, yes. Um, in our modern world, world, surrounded with the latest cutting edge technological advancements and really changing environment, 
we start to understand the importance of good governance more. We start to perceive how agile and adaptive the government should be in order to go hand in hand with all the recent innovations. In Azerbaijan, good governance is of great importance for the government. Thus, as an integral part of the reforms made by the government, uh, state agents for public services and social innovations under the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan as established by the presidential decree in 2012. Here at the state agency, we are striving to do best for the citizens uh, to render the services in an effective and efficient way. Uh, to formulate our e-governance systems based on the citizen-centric and data-driven approach while digitalizing as much as possible. Uh, the direction of activities of the state agency include not only service rendering in one-stop shops, but also innovations, digital solutions, and social projects. In terms of digital solutions, uh, non-stop shop model of online service delivery is utilized to increase the efficiency and accessibility. Uh, we are trying to move from our one-stop shop model to non-stop shop uh, model of uh, rendering services to our citizens. Uh, taking, taking into account that during the upcoming session, my colleagues will speak about our activities in detail. I would like to wrap up my speech with uh, final notes. Uh, I know that uh, during our sessions, uh, there will be very uh, fruitful and uh, very beautiful uh, uh, speech and uh, discussions. That's why uh, I, I don't want to uh, to to talk a lot. I'd like to once again thank ISDB for this valuable platform to share our best practice with the CIC countries, especially with Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, it should be highlighted that uh, we have good bilateral relations with these two states as well. And we are always uh, ready to share our uh, experiences with them and with all countries. I am deeply grateful to the audience for their attention and wish good luck uh, to the work of uh, the session. And uh, once again, thank you very much for, uh, for organizing such a beautiful event. And I wish good luck uh, again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Jehun Salmanov, for your welcoming remarks from uh, the sub uh, And uh, now we would uh, like to call on Mr. Tamerlan Tagiev, uh, the executive director uh, uh, of Azerbaijan and several uh, CIS countries as well in the region uh, from ISDB to, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rada Ahmed. And I also want to welcome our dear participants, uh, uh, Mr. Jehun Salmanov, uh, Mr. Anas Aysami, uh, Asami, and uh, Honorable uh, Mr. Said Shakil Shah. And uh, uh, it's great pleasure to see you today here. I would like to also uh, greet our participants from uh, esteemed countries such as Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. And by a very good chance, actually, I'm joining today this session from uh, Bishkek, uh, beautiful city of Bishkek uh, from Kyrgyzstan. And we have joined here, uh, we came here to participate in an event uh, which talks about the importance of data and uh, um, how data would affect our development in the future. Uh, and just from this perspective, for uh, I want to say that uh, Asan services, uh, although I will talk a little bit more uh, about it, but Asan service uh, is also, uh, Asan Khidmat is also a place where data is gen generated and it is generated under one uh, uh, roof, so uh, please also look at it from this perspective as well, how to generate data, how to uh, in the future use the, this data for the development purposes. And just to be aware of what's going on in your uh, country, in your uh, social life, in your uh, economic life, and uh, what is really needed to your population. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here today also because I'm representing the uh, five uh, Central Asian countries, Azerbaijan and Albania in the board of executive directors uh, uh, of the Islamic Development Bank. 
and we ha actually have initiated this um, cooperation long time ago and i'm really happy and i want to thank isdb team for bringing this uh, cooperation to this stage where we have already we are starting to share the experience of asan with our member countries and i hope that this will grow further to other 57 uh, ISDB member countries as a successful model. As a citizen of Azerbaijan, I'm really, um, I really want to share my uh, experience, uh, how uh, the life became easy after the introduction of Asan service in Azerbaijan. Uh, I don't want to tell you, uh, for example, how uh, much time we were spending just to get the uh, foreign passports, uh, we, so, uh, we call them passports previously, and now you can do it within a day um, or so. Uh, and uh, other, uh, you can receive, uh, I believe our uh, colleagues from Asan Khidmat will tell you how many services currently we can get through Asan Khidmat. Uh, but this is immense and it's unbelievable uh, what has been achieved. Uh, I would really encourage uh, our uh, other countries to use this model or at least to understand what it is about and try to uh, uh, do the same in their uh, respective beautiful member uh, countries. Uh, I'm also the head, uh, acting head of the Center for Analysis and Coordination of the Fourth Industrial Revolution under the Ministry of Economy. And uh, this uh, provides me with... Uh, uh, I, I, I know why that data is important, why the digitalization is important. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to see this cooperation between Islamic Development Bank and the Karak Institute, uh, with whom we are already working on digitalization uh, initiatives in the Central Asian countries and in the Karak region overall. Uh, so, uh, without taking too much of your time, I want to really uh, uh, thank you for this initiative and uh, also uh, wish good luck to the event. Uh, and I hope to see real results after the event, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Tamerlan, uh, uh, for your welcoming remarks and uh, for sharing your experience also with Asan. I think uh, we do thank you for being the driver, the main engine for this initiative to take place. I think uh, starting from the beginning of the year, this has been uh, on our agenda in our discussions with you. And we really want to thank you for, for, uh, for driving this initiative uh, uh, forward. So uh, thank you for your remarks as well. And now we will move on to our last uh, speaker for the welcoming remarks, Mr. Said Shakil Shah. Uh, the director uh, from the Karak Institute. Uh, so you're welcome, please, to also share your welcoming remarks. And before uh, I forget, uh, I, I will also, uh, after Mr. Uh, Said Shakil finishes his remarks, we would like to ask all the um, speakers from the welcoming remarks to, to keep their cameras on so we can take a quick uh, group photo before moving on to the next session. Uh, Mr. Said Shakil Shah, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmad. Uh, respected Anas Esami, CEO, C COO, Islamic Development Bank, Mr. Jehan Salamov, Deputy Chairman, State Agency for Public Services and Social Innovation under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, Mr. Tamilan Tagayev, Executive Director of ISDB. Panelists, moderators, discussants, learned participants of today's webinar, a very warm uh, welcome to this ISDP, SASI, and CI joint webinar. As we all know, the world economies are transforming fast as a result of rapid spread of new digital technologies with major implications for Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals. Digital technologies are critical to achieving SDGs, responding to and overcoming the COVID-19 crisis and other challenges. It will have implications for virtually all the SDGs and will affect all countries, sectors, and stakeholders. According to World Economic Forum report, digitization has generated trillions of dollars in economic activity in recent years and continued to accelerate globally. Public and private sectors have long recognized the potential for electronic commerce or e-commerce as we call it, as a great equalizer as it enables them to overcome many of the traditional challenges. 
The Karak region is one of the growing regions of the world with countries at different stages of policy formulation and regulatory environment for harnessing the full potential of digitization. CARIC Institute has developed a research portfolio related to digitization, including digital gap analysis, e-commerce, fintech, and ESPS certification areas. CARIC, CARIC Institute is looking forward to cooperation with international organizations and development partners to map the inhibitors which are preventing CARIC countries in harnessing full potential of digital technologies, both for private sector as well as for the public sector. The studies of the CARIC Institute have found that CARIC countries have different levels of digitization, some being champions and some having difficulties in various areas. Therefore, the digital gap in the region is significant. The study on regulatory framework of e-commerce per CARIC region found that CARIC member countries have all enacted relevant laws, but the laws are not always consistent and they are often out of step with the international best practices. So public policy lessons coming out of these studies points towards the need to update legislative framework, ensure conformity with internationally recognized standards and have harmonized laws and approaches among themselves and adhere to a number of international conventions. Also, it, our studies provide recommendation across all infrastructure areas, including improvement of infra internet infrastructure, such as expanding last mile coverage, launching 5G networks, enhancing digital literacy, development of business oriented infrastructure, promote digital payments, establishing backbone networks, data centers, as mentioned by learned speaker before me, e-clouds that can help boost e-commerce and e-government throughout the region and reduce gaps among CARIC countries. While private sector has been more responsive and adaptive to opportunities, public sector in most of the cases has lagged in lever leveraging digital technologies for enhanced outcomes for businesses as well as for the public. This builds a strong case for regional knowledge sharing, hence this webinar is a very welcome development. Azerbaijan has developed forward-looking and progressive policies, which are now getting translated into better economic outcomes and governance experience for the businesses as well as for the public. Assam brings wide range of state services into a one-stop shop. E-services are used to make interaction between government and public more efficient and transparent, reduces corruptions, eradicate or minimize direct contact between state agencies and citizens, reduce extra expenses and loss of time by citizens, promote ethical values, promote civilized behavior, improve the level of professionalism, strengthen confidence toward the state structures and ensure a greater use of electronic services. Creates an environment in which government, businesses and publics interact in a more efficient ways for better outcomes. So today's knowledge sharing uh, by the uh, relevant uh, entities uh, of Azerbaijan and also uh, the studies which will, uh, by Karak Institute, which will be presented I think it, can, it is a good learning experience for other countries in the region so that they can leapfrog and don't go through that learning curve and straight away apply those digitization technologies in their e-government sectors. Colleagues, uh, so I'm sure uh, these th uh, themes and the discussions and the question and answers, they will be very thought provoking and it will help the public policy practitioners in the uh, uh, neighboring countries uh, to further um, enhance their e-government initiatives and make them more efficient and user-friendly. So I wish you all a very productive webinar. Webinar, thank you very much from my side. Over to you, Ahmed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sayed Shakir Shah, uh, for your welcoming remarks. And really, uh, you've really helped uh, set the stage for the subsequent session. So thank you so much for your comments. Uh, now, uh, if you don't mind, we will just ask uh, the main speaker, the welcoming remarks uh, speakers to keep their cameras on so we can go ahead and take a quick snapshot. Uh, communication is also very important. So, uh, Brother Ishraq, if you can please help us uh, with a, a screenshot and let me know when you're done so we can go to the next session. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, again, many thanks to all of our esteemed speakers for uh, setting the stage. And now we're going to move into the next session, which I will also moderate. 
the uh, title of this session is Enhancing Public Service Delivery from a Regional Perspective, Current Challenges and Development Perspectives. Our first speaker is, is Mr. Abdul Aliyev. Uh, he is currently the head of International Relations Department at the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Since 2016, he has been working at the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Uh, from 2016 to 2018, he served as the Director of Gabala Regional Assam Service Center. In April 2018, Mr. Aliyev was appointed Head of the International Relations Department of the State Agency. Mr. Aliyev holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Baku State University, a master's degree in national security and political strategy from Baku State University as well, and a second master's degree in international economics and political studies from Charles University in Prague, the Czech Republic. So Mr. Abdul Aliyev, we will start with your uh, presentation first uh, and then move on to the next speakers. You're welcome to uh, you know, share your screen for your presentation. Uh, if there's any technical issues, Brother Ishraq can help us with the master slides. Uh, but the floor is yours, please. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, if you give me some host, then I can share my presentations. So, uh, dear brothers, honorable speakers, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. It's a big pleasure to see and understand you all today. I would like to thank you, the keynote speakers, for the valuable input and wish good luck to all the panelists speaking today. I strongly believe that this webinar will provide valuable insights and be useful. So we have a good relationship with Kyrgyzstan side, Tajikistan side, uh, ISTB side, and I believe uh, and I'm sure after this meeting, we not have only uh, good relations, but we have at the same time a good productive relation with uh, these countries. So uh, I would, if your permission, I would like to start my presentations. Um, firstly, let me shortly inform the distinguished audience about Azerbaijan's activities in the field of public administration and public service in the recent years. As Mr. Salmanov mentioned, uh, the State Agency for Public Services and Social Innovations was established upon the presidential decree back 2012 as an integral part of the reforms in the sphere of public administrations. The direction of uh, activities of the state agency compromise unified management of the assigned services and assigned communal centers, implementation of the services in those centers along, along with assessment or, of rendering services. Let me note that the state agency directions of activities are not limited only to public services, but also extended to innovations, digital solutions, and social projects. The enumerated activities uh, are implemented via the subordinate bodies to the state agencies, such as Innovation Center, EGOF Development Center, ABAT, Pablo Legal Entity, and etc. The distinguished audience will be informed about the, all these bodies in detail during the upcoming sessions and the next webinar. So next slide, please. As a model of uh, one-stop-shop concept, a sun representative and innovative approach for making the difference to people lives by providing services in an integ integrated and uniform manner. The establishment of Assan services has helped to reduce extra expenses and loss of time for many citizens. Upgrade the level of professionalism, ensure a larger use of electronic services, and increase transparency. It should be noted that Assam service centers were established upon the principle of transparency, efficiency, effectiveness, and inclusivity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Right now, we have more uh, 300, uh, 320 services are rendered in 21 Assam service centers and through the mobile services. 
Six of the services centers are located in the capital city of Baku, while others are uh, distributed all over the different regions of Azerbaijan. It should be noted that the mobile services are delivered through 10 buses and one train based on more than 2.5 million applications. Up until today, the services have been rendered to the citizens based on more than 47 million applications. A citizen is always, always right. Approach is applied through the Asan service systems. So in Asan service system, we have, uh, for example, it's ID card, passport, changing driver license, migration service, notary services, archive, military, and etc. What makes this service particularly unique is that the state agencies, which is one entirely new and natural body, manages the operation of Assam service centers and is responsible for establishing standards and work principles. The government agencies and private companies alike, on the other hand, are directly responsible for providing their own services. The responsibilities of the state agency do not, do not include provision of service and therefore there is no conflict of interest and duplication between the state agency and service providing agencies. Moreover, with um, uh, gen um, gender equality, we have uh, volunteerism in our centers. Um, for example, volunteerism is the most notable activity of Assam services. More than 27,000 young people have successfully undergone a volunteerism activity in the centers. Also nearly 2,000 uh, professional distinguished young people have been employed by you, by us and other state entities, private companies and enterprises. Next slide, please. The daily number of applications to the services is more than 31,000, yes. From uh, the very beginning, the fundamental goal of creating a sun service center was to accomplish strong citizen center and accountable institution. More than 90 citizens, 90% uh, citizen satisfaction rates evidently prove that we have achieved our main goal so far. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I mentioned before, it's a mobile services. Um, uh, I give this information. Next slide, please. Okay, about digitalization. Next slide. So, as I have uh, already mentioned, public services need to spearhead the innovations to deal with complex challenges. The priorities of the state agencies include harnessing disruptive technology to serve more effectively and efficiently to the citizens. For that purpose, a golf development center subordinate to the state agency is established by the presidential decree. By using modern information technologies and adhering to the non-stop shop model, the center ensures provi uh, provision of information and services by the related state bodies for all citizens of Azerbaijan, as well as legal entities and foreigners. The Gov Development Center manages information exchanging, exchanging between the information system and research of, uh, of state bodies and delivery of e-services through the Gov portal. Next slide, please. So, at the moment of the period of transition from reactive electronic government services, to the proactive electronic government service has started. Taking into consideration this substantive change, a new electronic portal, MyGov, was introduced to the public. MyGov is a, in a service system rendering services of government and private entities in a single platform based on a forward-looking government. Next slide, please. So we have uh, several, a lot of projects. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, my colleagues will do more information about it. But one of the good projects, uh, it's a Assam Visa. Assam Visa is a system facilitating the visa processes and providing access to the foreign citizens to get an electronic visa easily and quickly. 
this system has gained huge reputation and success because of its being an easy and user-friendly system. The system is based on three easy steps. steps filling the online application form, paying, and downloading your visa. The system operations is, have two direct directions. One of the electronic visa issues through the portal. Second one is the provision of visa issues upon the arri uh, arrival of <coughs> at international airports of Azerbaijan. Only national passport details are required during the application process for the electronic visas. Depending on the applications, choice visa can be used within three days or three hours it should be mentioned uh, that assigned visa is available for the citizens of more uh, 19 uh, 90 countries next slide please innovations um, innovations are among the state agency direction of activities. In that regard, innovation center subordinate to the state agency provide technical support for the innov innovative pro projects. Moreover, Innoland Incubation and Acceleration Center with the above mentioned entity supports the startups and their early uh, stages develops acceleration programs to help them grow and fit into the market and careers out of IT uh, trainings. Next slide, please. So in the international uh, area, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, okay, let me briefly mention the international relations and cooperation carry a uh, fundamental importance uh, for the state agency. Bilateral memorandum of understanding have been signed with more than approximately 20 countries. Uh, it's including Italy, Montenegro, Korea, Turkey, Morocco, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, in, and international organizations, ITSESCO, USLJ, Africa, and etc. Moreover, we have several beneficial projects with our diverse international partners. The state agency has been the winner of prestigious UN Public Service Award for its Assange Service project in 2015. Moreover, uh, for the remarkable achievements in the field of digitalization, the state agency has been awarded with UN Special Award for promoting digital transformation in the public sector during UN Public Service Forum Baku in 2019. We have a lot of awards, certificates, but usually we mention, uh, emphasize these two awards. Uh, I, would, I would like to mention one of the point. Uh, in 2015, we have more 800 candidates uh, and Assam model is uh, winner of uh, uh, Assam, Assam model is a, a get uh, first place winner. So next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I, I mentioned before, next slide, please. So about uh, Assam associations. Um, uh, I would like to also mention that during the UN Public Service Forum uh, held in Baku in 2019, declaration of intent of on establishment of Assam International Association was signed. The purpose of this association is to share knowledge, expertise, and experience in the field of public service delivery. We'll be happy to see uh, the respective OIC entities as a member of the Assam Association. I would like to kindly note that the state agency is open to new partnership in diverse spheres with the respective entities of the CIC uh, countries in the future. Next slide, please. So um, we're speaking uh, awards uh, uh, according to the cooperation agreement signed between ICESCO, International Organization, and the state agency in 2018, ASAN, uh, ICESCO award for advanced governance has been established and is planning to be presented for experiments reflecting innovations in member states. We are planning to launch uh, this award in the next year. And I invited the countries to apply to this award too. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay. Um, 
So uh, having reached to the end of my presentation, I would like to emphasize that continuous developments and improvements are required to maintain uh, the sustainability of efficient public services. Political will, institutional culture and evolutionary approach, not one time radical changes, will guarantee the desired outcome. By learning from the best practices to uh, the public sector, will be in a position to deliver quality service. Azerbaijan is ready to share its successful experience in that regard. I extend my sincere regret to the distinguished audience for attention, and I firmly believe that the work of the event, as well as the ideas shared by the respectable speakers, uh, will put a spotlight into activities in the particular sphere. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Abdelaliyev, uh, for your presentation. Uh, this was very rich in terms of uh, outlining all of these services that are being provided by Asan Hizmet for understanding its uh, current business model. So we really uh, thank you for that. And uh, as you said, we will have an opportunity to go into some details uh, during the rest of the day. Now, uh, I'm pleased to move on to our next speaker, uh, this time from our uh, uh, co-organizing institution, the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Mr. Siok Yong Yoon uh, will be making the next presentation. He is currently uh, a, a principal public management specialist, e governance at the Asian Development Bank uh, in the Digital Technology for Development Unit, the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. He is a focal person for ICT and digital development operations. Mr. Yoon has led a number of digital development and e governance projects as a project officer and organized various internal and regional knowledge events for the better use of digital technologies in ADB's various sector and thematic operations. As a focal person for digital development and e-governance, he plays an active role to mainstream digital technologies in ADB's uh, sector operations through technical assistances and sector thematic group activities and coordinates partnership programs with international development organizations as well as the private sector and civil society. Uh, Mr. Seo Kyung Yoon, uh, the floor is yours, please, for your presentation. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for kind introduction. Let me share my presentation first. Distinguished speakers, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. I'm S.Y. Yoon, working at Digital Technology Unit, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of Asian Development Bank. I would like to share ADB approach on digital development and my personal thought on foundational infrastructure for digital government programs. First, ADB's digital technology projects at a glance. ADB supported 461 digital technology projects from 2010 to 2020. 17% of total ADB projects approved in 2020, last year, including digital component. The number of digital technology projects are growing at, uh, for the last five years, as you can see, although there are some fluctuation in the number of projects. Technical assistance are more than loans and grants, indicating that more and more digital technology projects are being prepared and processed. These sets of guiding principles show ADB approach to digital development actions. Uh, it is not official though. The first, ADB values digital technology as an engine for economic growth and overcoming the middle income traps in developing member countries. And second, we will apply an integrated and holistic approach to digital development action to respond to the complex and multi-dimensional development challenges. Third, 
will support the creation of a strong foundation to enable the development and delivery of digital services across sectors and thematic areas. And fourth, we'll improve digital safeguard by supporting the management of privacy and security risk associated with digital technology and platforms. And fifth, we are going to promote inclusive digital development. This means that digital development intervention should take into account those who are vulnerable, marginalized, and excluded from the potential benefit from the digital economy. And last but not least, we'll take different uh, differentiated approaches based on our member countries' development priorities and needs and their development uh, readiness. You might have seen this diagram and similar picture somewhere else. This shows a general trend, not necessarily reflecting actual, uh, but you can see uh, the phase, uh, different phase in the development. In this, in this slide, you can see nature of evolution of digital government and sequence of digital government stages. From my view, many developing countries at the second stage, developing a separate e-government system per organization and per institution. Now they are taking a whole of government approach and preparing an integrate, integration of the fragmented e-government systems. Then the problem is how. I will discuss how to develop integrated e-government system uh, throughout my presentation. E-government foundation is a uh, prerequisite for any e-government programs. Without hard and soft uh, foundation for e-government displayed here, any e-government system doesn't work. So it is necessary to prepare robust e-government foundations to develop even a single e-government application. The e-government foundation consists of both physical and soft infrastructure. Building physical infrastructure such as a national broadband backbone and data center is important, but preparing soft infrastructure such as national ID, special data infrastructure, and information sharing system mechanism are equally or more important. Starting from geospatial data infrastructure, GIS, uh, geographic information system is a foundational information for digital government. It is necessary and critical for all kinds of government activities as well as development project, including land use planning, infrastructure construction and management and social and government services at the city level, provincial level and national level as well. In this pandemic situation, national and city level GIS is one of the most effective tools for various government programs, such as contact tracing activities, social protection program. However, in most cases, GIS is developed in silo and geospatial information is neither shared nor reused uh, for other purpose. The whole land information system requires a layered land related information systems, which are to be integrated and then interlinked to provide a comprehensive picture on land and properties in a country. However, in most developing countries, the land information system is not based on robust special data infrastructure. So land information is not accurate and not much utilized uh, for other purpose, as they are not linked to each other. Also, the development cost for the land-related information system 
is much higher than it should be because the system is not linked to each other. As you can see at this slide, the National Special Data Infrastructure is foundation for land administration, cadastral maps, land registration, and property tax management. Identification is another foundational infrastructure as legal identity enables citizens to access to various government services. Unique identification system is critical for financial inclusion, healthcare services, and social protection programs. In particular, in the context of COVID-19, many countries try to provide emergency cash assistance to the most affected population by verifying the target beneficiaries using the national ID. ADB has been supported a national ID program in a number of countries. Cambodia, we provided technical assistance for the development of strategy since 2016. In the Philippines, uh, we are providing technical assistance for national ID implementation from 2018. In uh, PNG, uh, we uh, uh, carry out pilot project on ID box uh, for inclusive finance. And now we are uh, started to provide the technical assistance for Timor Leste to build the national identity system together with uh, e-government infrastructure. As I briefly mentioned earlier, e-government is evolving from passive uh, website to simple transaction application to one-stop shop service, now non-stop shop model. In the past, uh, citizens have to visit multiple offices to complete a single application or transaction such as passport issuance, visa issuance, business registration. But now citizens can complete the application at a local office close to their residence. In some cases, they can make an application completely online uh, without visiting government office, uh, which is the case in Asan service. This uh, development uh, requires a mechanism for integration of fragmented e-government uh, systems. From now on, I will briefly introduce some example on how, what kind of mechanism countries made to make sure seamless integration among separate e-government system. First, India Stack. India Stack is largest open API in the world. Since its uh, deployment, India has been organizing hackathons to develop application using the APIs. India Stack is being implemented in stages, starting with uh, introduction in 2009 of the Aadhaar National ID. India Stack provides uh, common utilities and e-government services uh, for consent to cashless and paperless and presenceless e-government transactions. National ID is core enabler for common utilities. XROAD is backbone of e-Estonia and allows the country's various e-services information system to link up and function in harmony. Currently over thousand organizations and enterprises use XROAD system daily in Estonia. Also it is implemented in other neighboring countries. Lastly, the government of South Korea also developed the government information sharing platform to minimize requirement, uh, required document and office visit. This system dramatically reduced the number of paper documents as well as physical office visit required to complete a transaction such as tax filing, passport application, car registration, land registration, etc. The government has expanded this information sharing system in terms of types of information and target agencies.
Okay, this is the last slide. There are so many different routes to go to the peak, depending on weather, equipment, your own capacity. But there is no such universally right path to the peak, and there is no one size fit all solution for e government. All governments have to find the best strategic option, best fit to country's context. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. Mr. Yoon, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Yoon, for your presentation. Uh, now we will move on to uh, Dr. Kaiser Abbas uh, for the next presentation. And then, of course, we'll take some questions. We do have some questions for, uh, particularly for our colleagues from SAPSI. Uh, just to introduce Dr. Uh, Abbas, uh, uh, he joined Karek Institute in February 2020 as Chief of Research Division. Uh, Dr. Abbas holds PhD degree in human resource development from Nankai University, Tianjin, China in May 2000. He performed postdoctoral research at Cardiff Business School at Cardiff University in the UK in September 2007. He also holds a Master's of Science and Master of Philosophy in Economics from Kwaidi Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan. Dr. Abbas has worked as the Dean of the F Faculty of Business Administration at Comsats University, Islamabad as well as director of the Lahore campus of the same university. Professor Abbas is a prolific researcher who has produced a consistent stream of research output that includes 40 publications in national and international journals, nine conference proceedings, as well as seven conference presentations. Uh, Dr. Kaiser Abbas, uh, the floor is yours for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Ahmed, for the introduction. So, um, and, uh, Good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, panelists, and the participants. I am going to speak about e-commerce in the Karak region. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities that uh, e-commerce is facing in this particular region? And I am going to particularly mention here, this: these, uh, these are the outcome of our joint research uh, with ADB. So we have two projects completed on e-commerce. Uh, uh, with ADB, and I'm going to share the main findings of those two projects. Next slide, please. Uh, so the sequence of my presentation will be like, I will be giving background of e-commerce development in the Karak region, uh, very quick, very briefly, and then I will speak about uh, the Karak Institute e-commerce related studies with Asian Development Bank. And then uh, finally, I will talk about the main challenges and opportunities uh, that e-commerce is facing in this particular character region. And then finally, I wrap up with the recommendations uh, in terms of uh, e-commerce for this character region. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, as we know that CARIC uh, region presents a strong contrast in e-commerce development. And as uh, China is uh, leading the world in online retail and also is cited as one of the role models for the future of e-commerce in, in, in the world not only in Karak region. So e-commerce in most of the other Karak countries, as we know that is underdeveloped and way below its potential. So uh, e-commerce development in the region is highly heterogeneous in terms of its hardware, e-commerce infrastructure, and its soft component, including regulatory, legal, and institutional framework. So major uh, issues are the problem with e-commerce are the outdated regulations, varied in digital infrastructures and fragmented governance are the example of main roadblocks of this uh, e-commerce in the Karak region. If we look at the table, this table just gave us an idea about what percentage of uh, population people are using uh, business to consumer services, which is very important for the e-commerce in the region. So if we look at uh, the percentage uh, is highest for China, of course, where, which is the leader of e-commerce in this region and in the world as well. And then if you look at uh, Kazakhstan, then Georgia, and then uh, is Azerbaijan is 33%. And then on average, if we talk about, so uh, excluding China, 29% uh, people in the Karak region overall, they are using e-commerce. Uh, facilities, uh, business to consumer facilities, which is quite low. And uh, uh, we have significant challenges in this region uh, related to ICT infrastructures, which this very widely in the CARIC region. E-payments 
uh, this uh, government needs to promote expansion and use of digital payments, transparency, and other things related to cash-related transaction uh, in the region. And delivery logistics is very important, uh, one of the obstacle, and this uh, this this very widely in in the Karak region. Next slide, please. Uh, in this table, so it's uh, we are going to use uh, uh, this e-commerce index, which is calculated by. United Nations Council on Trade and Development. So uh, this index actually is calculated by using four main parameters. If you look in this table, the first column is share of individual using the internet, which is internet as we know that is one of the important source uh, for e-commerce businesses. And uh, if we look at the figures, so uh, in Georgia, it is 71% people are using, 61 in China, Kazakhstan, 87. So overall, if we talk about uh, an average 56% of people uh, are using internet from the whole population in this region. Share of individual with an account. This is also again a very important parameter for e-commerce uh, services in the in, in the country. So if we, if we look at uh, this, uh, the people who have age of 15 plus, so with a bank account, so the percentage is quite higher for the Mongolia, 93%, and then followed by China, 80, and then Georgia. 61, but for the rest of the countries, the percentage is quite low. Uh, so that's one of the very important parameters for e-commerce uh, services in, in, in the country. And next is the secure internet servers, which is very more important parameter. So how much and the internet server are supporting the online transaction in the country. So you can see on every 50%, if you, we talk about whole Karak region, uh, this uh, these services provided, then UPU, Post reliability score is again one of the important parameters for this, which is used for e-commerce index. So percentage higher for Georgia and then China and then for this uh, Kazakhstan, but for the other countries and then also for Azerbaijan, it's also quite high, 82 percent. So it's good. Then for the rest of the country, it's quite low. On average, if we talk about for the whole Karak region, it's 46 percent. And uh, now this, uh, if we come to the this e-commerce index, actually, which e-commerce index actually is the uh, index which shows the country readiness, uh, readiness of e-commerce businesses. So if we talk about the percentages, so there is higher for Georgia, 73% than China, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Azerbaijan. So these countries is, is almost 60 plus percent, uh, this index. And then if we look at the other countries, it's quite low, but overall, is 50% uh, uh, is the e-commerce index. Um, but if we look at the index value change, so it is positive for some of the countries, it is negative. So it means that for some countries it is it is increasing, but for most of the countries it is going down. Uh, next slide, please. Now, after this back, background introduction of e-commerce in the category, I am going to talk about specific our research which we have conducted uh, in the last two years on e-commerce. Next slide, please. Uh, so if we look at this in this slide, if, uh, there are three dimensions. So these dimensions actually are found by this uh, UN, UNES, UNESCAP and ADB against in uh, 18. So they identify three main dimensions of e-commerce. First is economic factors and conditions. Second is legal institutional environment. And third is social acceptance and awareness. So a uh, Carrick Institute with the Asian Development Bank, jointly we conducted uh, work on two dimensions, especially one first dimension is economic factors and, and conditions. So under this, we have a study uh, completed this year in March, started in 2020, that was, we looked into the uh, status of e-commerce infrastructure, uh, the development of e-commerce infrastructure in the Carrick Bank in terms of in, in, uh, internet infrastructure, payments, logistics, and e-commerce market. And then uh, second is dimension is legal and institutional. So we have also completed the study back in 2020 uh, about the regulatory framework in the CARIC region. So where in terms of uh, legal, uh, uh, this uh, category stand in terms of income. So I'm going to speak all these uh, dimensions later on in detail. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the first study, as I, I, I talked about, is uh, research on uh, which, we, which examined actually the state of legislation and regulation of electronics commerce in the 11 member countries of the CARIC region and uh, recommended ways to actually modernize and harmonize them with international standard. 
so our research uh, has covered and reviewed legislative and regulatory environment from all the government members come countries related to specifically uh, electronic transaction uh, electronic payments uh, privacy and cyber crime consumer protection then uh, we have uh, the second research that we completed in this year in 20 march 2021 is about uh, the infrastructure uh, the status of infrastructure related to e-commerce in the Carib region so here uh, particularly, we focused on four things so that uh, this uh, assessing the internet to engage in online transaction, making and receiving payments, delivery, logistics, and e-commerce market. Next slide, please. Now, the challenges and opportunities uh, of the e-commerce based on these studies. What are the major challenges that uh, e-commerce is facing, and what are the opportunities exist for this Karak region? Uh, first, as I mentioned, that is the infrastructure. Uh, that that the and if with an infrastructure we want to know that internet is one of the important uh, this parameter based need which is essential for e-commerce in the Karak region. So last mile assess as uh, my director was also mentioning that there are significant differences in internet use among the Karak members countries based on the latest availability survey. Uh, usage ranges from 90 percent in Kazakhstan to around 20 percent in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So this is there is wide uh, difference in this. And affordability is not an issue, actually. And growing evidence uh, it finds that the other factors, such as the digital literacy, are becoming more of an obstacle in relation to e-commerce. Affordability is not a major challenge. And uh, digital literacy is uh, one of the major challenges related to internet. Next, please. Uh, again, if we, I continue with this internet, like uh, CI research with ADB has carried out in, in few countries about why individuals also do not use the internet. And we found that 69% of the respondents indicated that they did not, in Pakistan, they indicated that they did not use the internet because they did not know what it was and over half of the respondents in the PRC did not know how to use it. While 40% of the household in Azerbaijan reported that they did not have the internet access because computers were too expensive, over one fifth of they said they lacked the skills used to internet. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, so what are the key points on internet? So on supply side, most current countries have significant and adequate level of infrastructure that's posed to the general public in assessing of internet. On the demand side, digital literacy is the main barrier to the internet. So another demand side constraint is the vast majority of the internet within the current country do not shop online. So there are a few other, other uh, this key points uh, like cybersecurity is one of the major concerns uh, for this region. And also this core data infrastructure, such as data and other issues are also uh, related to internet uh, issues in the CARIC region. Next slide, please. Then second uh, component in infrastructure development is about uh, this uh, payments, such as uh, e-wallets and bank transfer through QR codes also provide convenience. So there are some uh, issues related to e-payments as well. Most CARIC countries have experienced strong growth in this cash payment penetration. However, uh, still uh, there is need uh, to do more and government need to provide more support uh, for the promotion of e-commerce in terms of fintech and financial technology. Next slide, please. Uh, then logistic is the third component related to infrastructure development. Again, the majority of the carrier countries have universal postal services and uh, a key enabler for e-commerce at the same time, at least before the COVID-19 crisis, buyer want more diversity in package delivery option and postal operation need to adopt more diversified delivery choice. So there is need to provide more support by the government uh, related to logistics in the Iskarak region. Next slide, please. Uh, so electronic, uh, so uh, now the other study that I mentioned is about the legal and uh, regulatory framework. Uh, so electronic transactions, so is one of the area where we see that some of the country has single law on e transaction, often called law, on electronic signature and electronic document. But some countries do have two laws, one separate on electronic uh, signature and electronic documents. So that need to be consistent. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, regulation about privacy. Yes, most of the current countries have uh, privacy laws. The laws tend to reflect the main points of internet standard. Personal data, this should be collected only when the consent of the data subject and only purpose for which the data will obtain. However, uh, all CARIC members should have a privacy lesson that need to be consistent with the international best practices available in the region. Next, please. And uh, cybercrime, most countries have this uh, these laws, but these laws need to 
and uh, enact with the international best practices. Next slide. So uh, Nabas, lastly, uh, I will wrap up in yeah, I will wrap okay. up in next not to interrupt you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I will wrap up in the next two minutes, please. Uh, so consumer protection is an important area which needs to be taken care of uh, by the respective governments in the care region. Next slide, please. Now I will I will finish in the next two slides. So recommendation for e-commerce development for the care region uh, related to infrastructure development. Care countries need to focus on improving internet infrastructure, such as expanding last mile coverage, as mentioned by my director as well, launching 5G's network, enhancing digital literacy, promoting enterprise e-commerce use, and so on. And there is also need uh, to widen financial inclusion, enhance the e-payment system uh, in, in, in the care countries. Logistics requires the expansion of home delivery coverage, increasing the quality of delivery networks, improving logistics services, and addressing cross-border issues uh, related to e-commerce activities. Next slide, please. Some recommendations for the uh, about the laws and regulations uh, studies. So uh, the, we need to include some private sector representation on some of the version of the, uh, this in, in important task force, which are established by the government. Uh, there's a need to coordinate legal uh, advice across government. Different departments or agencies must end up with consistent opinion on key matters. And there is need to ensure that all parts of the government and other players have the right and capacity to communicate electronically. Uh, so these are some of the recommendations related to laws and regulations. And thank you so much uh, for listening. I stop here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abbas, thank you so much uh, for your presentation in, uh, with important details on the state of digitalization in the Karak region. Uh, and the data on internet usage, e-commerce, and related information is very useful in providing a holistic picture about the region uh, and to identify target areas uh, for uh, interventions. Now, uh, I know we're a bit over time, but there is a question uh, before we conclude this session. There is, I just wanted to pose this question. Uh, it is to, to our colleagues from SUBSI, Mr. Abdul uh, Aliyev, if you'd like to take these, uh, you're welcome to, or even in the subsequent sessions, perhaps if, if they're relevant, our colleagues can answer them as well. But just to read those questions out, what uh, it's from Dorothea Lazaro. What is the current status of data exchange and interoperability of systems among different agencies in Azerbaijan? That's the first one. Uh, the second one is, does the e-government development center also cover business trade processes and how is this linked with customs? Uh, and lastly, is there a plan to include digital services with other countries to accommodate cross-border transactions? So those are some questions from Dorothea to our panelists, uh, particularly to Sapsi. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Abdul Aliyev, would you like to? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for the great presentations. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. But I think it will be better if my colleague, Mr. Sultan Bayramov, uh, answer for these questions because he's a deputy uh, of the Development Center. Uh, Mr. Bayramov, the floor is yours. Ladies and gents, thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Sultan. Uh, I am the deputy director of the e-government development center in Azerbaijan. And with your permission, I will try, I will attempt to answer the questions raised by our colleagues. So the first question was about the current status of data exchange and interoperability of system among different agencies in Azerbaijan. Yes, as we know, each government agency stores and manages its own data. So in Azerbaijan, we, uh, we have the decentralized uh, information system strategy. However, in order to better serve the citizens, the various government agencies must constantly transmit the necessary information to each other and to do it obviously safely and quickly. Uh, for this purpose, the uh, e-government development center has uh, developed the information exchange tool called Asan Bridge. Asan Bridge is the integrated module of the e-government information system in Azerbaijan, and it provides coordination of government information resources and systems, as well as stable and secure exchange of information between those resources and systems. The core advantage of the system is the fact that it is software-based and it enables faster and better quality service. 
So far, if you look at the statistics, 36 government organizations have successfully been integrated into the Assam Bridge. And we have the ongoing integration process with another 12 of them. Before uh, developing this system, we used to use the Estonian-made famous X-Road data exchange system. We used to utilize this one, but two years ago, we've made a strategic decision to come up with the in-house with the Azerbaijani-made product in order to replace this system. And as I mentioned, the big majority of the government organizations have already been successfully integrated into this system. I hope I was able to cover the answer to the first question. Uh, if yes, then I will yes. switch to the second question with your permission. Yes. Yeah, let's let's go ahead. Maybe in the next thirty seconds or so, just because we're a bit over time with the first session. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll quickly cover the second one. Yes, the the business trade processes is one of the core mandates of the e-government development center. We are developing lots of G2B solutions. One of which is is called Assam Finance. So all of the banks, the insurance companies, and other trade companies in Azerbaijan, when they serve to the customers, they don't need to require any paper documents. We provide them with the access to the government information systems. And with the permission of the citizens, they can obtain the necessary information and speed up their uh, service process. And when it comes to the customs, yes, the big majority of the operations in the state called customs committee have been digitalized, including electronic declaration of goods, uh, 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 electronic payments of fees, uh, electronic appointments, identification of restrictions to leave the border, um, uh, availability to check the statistics and the application status and other processes have been successfully digitalized. And the, very quickly about the third question, yes, for the moment we are negotiating with the Digital Transformation Office of Turkey uh, for the uh, integration of uh, uh, two um, information systems. And as the step one, as the very initial step, we are considering to integrate the COVID-19 passport related data. So when the citizens from two countries travel to each other, they don't need to present any paper documents. I hope I was able to quickly cover all these three questions. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's great. Uh, uh, I appreciate. I, uh, we really appreciate uh, these answers, and I think they've been useful. Hopefully, uh, this answered Dorothea's questions as well and was useful to everyone. So I will now turn it quickly over to my colleague, Mr. Kokurjan Aminov, to moderate the next session. Mr. Kokurjan Aminov is the operations team leader um, uh, from the Turkey hub of the Islamic Development Bank. And he will introduce the speakers. And I, uh, I owe you 15 minutes, Kokurjan. <laughs> Please yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Hamad. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, dear uh, participants, uh, distinguished speakers and colleagues. Uh, um, I believe like uh, the first uh, two, uh, two sessions were extremely useful. And before proceeding to uh, this session, let me just recap like a uh, few key points about Asan, Asan service, just uh, as our speakers for this session, uh, all, all three of them are from uh, the state agency for uh, public service and social innovations. So just first, first uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, Asan service became a brand by introducing new reforms in Azerbaijan, improving public service delivery, reducing bureaucracy, and introducing all these innovations and and improving the work of the public service. The the fact mentioned by Mr. Abdullahiev in terms of customer or user satisfaction rate of 99% is a very solid proof of that. Uh, second point uh, um, uh, uh, that I want to make is that uh, Asan service has be has become a reference for re reference point for all uh, innovations and reforms that is uh, ongoing in Azerbaijan. Country has a strong uh, aspiration and ambition to be to become a smart and knowledge based economy, and all uh, in innovations that uh, Asan is proposing in terms of uh, Asan Pay, for instance, Asan Visa, Asan Train, like. Uh, uh, reaching out to you know like to uh, 
uh, population in uh, remote areas. These are kind of uh, uh, showcasing like innovative model uh, like for other sectors of the economy. And third point uh, that was also highlighted is uh, Asan, Asan service has become a champion of South-South cooperation by promoting its services and working with other countries and other partners right and uh, uh, like uh, delivering its service uh, service uh, uh, like i mean uh, uh, delivery model with uh, i mean this this uh, these are very important factors that we need to highlight and now uh, we have uh, three uh, distinguished speakers uh, from asan service um, and uh, they will uh, go into the details right of how 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 uh, uh, asan service uh, works and uh, First, let, uh, we, we will start with uh, Mr. Mohammad Ali Khudaiwardiyev. He's the head of uh, uh, head of uh, Division International uh, Relations Department. He's uh, been in uh, Assam service uh, um, like uh, I uh, from the very beginning, right? Since 2012. Um, and before that, he worked with uh, a number of international organizations, uh, including the UN institutions. And uh, he basically is part of the uh, success story of uh, SAPSI and Assam service. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Khudai Verdiev, over to you, um, please. Thank you, dear brother Koko Chan. So good morning, everybody, uh, distinguished audience. Uh, so I just carefully uh, just listened to the, all the presenters uh, and uh, I took the, the, some very important notes and I will refer uh, during, uh, during my, my presentation. Uh, with your permission, may I ask the, open the, the share screen uh, option because I made just a bit addition to, yeah, thank you so much, I appreciate it. So, uh, your permission. Uh, so now I'm sharing the presentation. Uh, most probably you you can see the presentation, right? So great. So uh, what uh, I would like just to, uh, to uh, start from scratch, scratch actually. Uh, so you know the uh, the one stop shop. Uh, the on its own is the governance. One of the good governance methods that. Uh, just commonly applying by different governments or states. Uh, actually, as a government of Azerbaijan, we did not invent uh, as a one-stop shop uh, as a very uh, integral part of the good governance, but we invent our best model of the public service delivery and a sun model. And in our, in our upcoming slides, I will uh, try to characterize, characterize and uh, uh, the visually, the, just the, how to say, the, uh, attach uh, all this important information. Uh, so the concept of the governance is not new, as you know, and it's uh, as old as human civilization. Simply out, uh, this is the decision making and the processes by the, which the decisions are implemented. So government is one of the actors in governance. Other actors also involved in the governance vary depending on the level of government that is under the discussion. As we already know, the, the good governance uh, has the eight core principles, and uh, I just uh, add these eight main uh, good governance principles uh, to this slide because this uh, this is. Uh, just all these eight, uh, just how to say, main principles of the good governance are uh, well applied in, in Assam service centers and its activities. So I would like to start uh, to the, from the effective and efficient. Uh, so first of all, as you know, the Assam service uh, established by the presidential decree uh, and uh, as an integral part uh, of the public administration reform in the government of Azerbaijan. And efficiency is an important part of a sound service centers. And uh, as, as, as our previous speakers touched upon this issue, Mr. Abdul and Mr. Jason Salmanov, uh, the without losing, uh, losing of time and without uh, just a bureaucracy, petty corruption. Uh, so we can uh, use uh, the, the, how to say, the, 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 the services that are uh, delivering by Assam service centers. Uh, 
Transparency is also the other important part of our sun service center. There is uh, no hand-to-hand uh, -hand payments and uh, all transactions are operated by video, uh, are, are just by bank departments and also recorded by video cameras. And uh, in terms of the transparency, we are also applying other uh, many mechanisms uh, such as the feedback uh, mechanisms uh, and uh, because this is also the part of the good governance issues there are a couple of the ways to leave their feedbacks and my colleague mr ruslan uh, will touch upon this issue and i will not go in the detail and in the meantime assam also uh, accountable uh, a place and accountable and responsible responsive uh, project uh, in terms uh, just uh, in terms of the public service uh, delivery from the perspective of the government and uh, in, ahead of the uh, population of, of Azerbaijan and uh, the foreign citizens who, is visiting in, who are residing in Azerbaijan. And uh, because uh, we are uh, we are just monthly and quarterly and yearly uh, just the sharing, distributing the, uh, the, 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 the reports, uh, not only to our governments, but also to the population and in a monthly regime, we have a special uh, section in our Facebook. Uh, we are just uh, uh, in a monthly regime. We regularly distribute, share this information uh, with our, how to say, the citizens uh, about the statistics, about the user friendly, about the satisfaction level, and other things. And I will come back to the other uh, the principles of the good governance, which are uh, currently applying in a sound service uh, by samples. These are the small, uh, the, the visually structure of the Assam Service Center uh, one-stop shop. I will not elaborate the, the importance of the one-stop shop, but I would like to highlight one important issue. As I mentioned uh, in, earlier, uh, just uh, uh, it did not as Azerbaijan the one-stop shop, but Assam. The uniqueness of Assam uh, is the uh, Assam is not is the place where the the, the government service and the private services uh, all together deliver from, from one place. Uh, and we, as a government, as a state agency for public service and social innovations under the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan, we do not render uh, any type of the services. So it, it cannot lead to the duplication of the services or to the conflict of interest between the government entities which are represented under the umbrella of Assam. From this perspective, uh, the government entities, namely 11, uh, precisely the 11 government entities seconded under the umbrella of Assam and uh, these services rendered uh, the, through the government agencies through the employees of the government agencies that are represented under the Assam, and these are the main uniqueness of Assam service. And uh, the, the main advantages of Azerbaijani model of the, of the one-stop shop are, the, are as follows, the human factor and the citizen-centric entity, right-based approach, cost-effectiveness and efficiency, sustainability, consistent perfection and updating. And I would like to also uh, articulate one important in, information about the updating and consistent perfection process because uh, if we stay in 2013 or in 2014 we can we can uh, the, the model of a sun or the model of our one-stop shop can be outdated but we, but we regularly uh, make uh, uh, respect relevant uh, the monitoring processes uh, and update issues on the services on the i from the it perspective from the e government perspective and uh, we try to up to date all the uh, main items of the assam service and the activities of the state ages, the agency and uh, the assam model uh, as my colleague uh, mr abdul mentioned now uh, successfully applying in a couple of countries and this model can be applied can be applied for many governmental structures from the federal system to the unitary level system or the central authority or the to the local regional authority system city council community level uh, why i just put this slide because you know there are many government structures uh, throughout the world in europe are different in Africa now, they are going to the, the, the from the national level to the localization level, and in maybe CIS countries, uh, as the uh, as Azerbaijan also is one of the CIS countries, they, we are, the the government structure level is 
somehow the close and the, and the Asia is different. So, but the uniqueness of the other, the, 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 the beneficiary uh, how to say, advantage of a sun model is the uh, is 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 uh, we can apply the sun model in in many systems. Uh, so the other direction of activity is the digitization. Uh, and uh, my colleague in in the uh, in upcoming days, uh, precisely the 17th of no November, will give you more detailed information. But I would like also to touch upon the. Uh, uh, the very important issue. Uh, as we are talking in this session in, about the integrated services, uh, so one-stop shop uh, embedded on its own the, uh, the offline model of the delivery of public services, but the other direction of activity is the e-government. And uh, our, the e-government or digital services uh, run by our ego development center, which was launched in 2018 and it's also a uh, function operates under the auspice of the state agency and uh, so this is the good model of the integration by our ego development center we providing or somehow we are ensuring the integration of the services and uh, most of the offline services uh, currently delivering through uh, some uh, service centers uh, also meantime we are just uh, uh, offer this type of the services through our ego uh, government service, uh, ego development center uh, as well. And uh, as our deputy chairman mentioned in, in, in the opening remarks, now Azerbaijan moving from the one-stop shop service delivery system to the non-stop shop de service delivery system. Uh, on, on its own, uh, this non-stop shop service system includes to the G2B, G2G and G2C, uh, the service, uh, how to say, the services. And we have a couple of projects uh, this, this, through this uh, the slide, you can see a uh, couple of projects, uh, but uh, my colleague, Ms., uh, Mr. Bayramo, will elaborate in, on the next day's uh, the session, this digital project. And uh, for now, uh, just uh, uh, 37, uh, or around 40 uh, organizations actually uh, integrated to our e-government portal. And uh, we have more than around uh, 200 million uh, the number of the use through our e-government uh, portal, uh, and sorry, one, one million plus, and the number of use is approximately reached to the two hundred million, and uh, this is the the, the the visually the visual how to say view of our MyGov uh, personal covenant in, in in Azerbaijan. Most of the citizens have such type of the MyGov personal cabinet, which uh, have the many uniqueness. And so this is the how to say proactive uh, type of the services. Uh, I would like to just uh, also take uh, one example. And uh, so well, once you just, uh, uh, the, how to say, the, the passport of citizen or ID card is going to be expired and the system automatically uh, alerts you like a three months or four months in advance or one month in advance, your passport, your ID card, your driving license is going to be expired and you need to be changed. Or you can make all type of, uh, the many type of the notary actions through this portal uh, and or just uh, in, in through your phone. And uh, also you can get uh, your vaccine pass or immune, uh, have the vaccine certificate or immune certificate through this micro personal cabinet. There are many, many positive uh, advantages but uh, we have the limited time, so therefore uh, I will not uh, go in the detail. These are the other e electronic and uh, uh, just the solution that we are currently applying uh, in, in Azerbaijan, and it's developed our ego development center, Assam payment, uh, all types of the penalties and fi fines, uh, or just the communal pay uh, utility payments can pay the through the Assam payment terminals. Uh, which will build configured in in huge supermarket in very big places of uh, in, in big cities and in, in and also this payment uh, this uh, how to say uh, solution has the its own portal as well and you can uh, log in uh, to your ascent some uh, payment cabinet and you can pay the uh, the terminals and it also. Uh, have the facility in, via the mobile application. And Asan Visa, my colleague Abdul touched upon this issue and I will not go into detail. And I also would like to highlight a very important issue with, because as you know, we are 
all the all of us still suffering the COVID malady, and uh, and it seems that uh, this this malady will live it with, with us a couple of years uh, as well. So uh, we need to endure uh, to live uh, with this uh, how to say the negative. Mo uh, momentum and we, we, we uh, it also encourage us to uh, to say to produce more solutions uh, to and uh, uh, living under such a very tragic circumstances and during the, this period also Assan and its uh, our state agents and its its eGov development center also uh, just uh, offered the new solutions and it's 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 called the how to say e system for permits and monitoring. And the last year, we per, we are just applying throughout the government, uh, throughout the country, uh, the permission system because now the the, the at that at that at those times, uh, the world the world uh, the, did not have the how to say the the vaccines, and the, we have certain uh, how to say obstacles. Uh, so therefore, uh, in the working period and the. In the using of the services, or if we are going to outside, out of home, uh, we have such type of the slogans: "Stay home and stay safe." And uh, if you want to go to out outside, you, can, you need to send the SMS, or you need to be registered in this relevant uh, portal. And this portal, the the how to say, uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, solution of our ego development center, and uh, uh, so. Also, you can get the, 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 the permission for the workers of public and private organizations. And by the way, uh, this model is successfully applied by the Turkestan region of the Kazakhstan. And uh, we also uh, offered this model other uh, CIS countries. And we also shared this experience with our other partners. And I also, last but not least, I also would like to touch upon the importance of the Sun International Trainings. My colleague uh, Ulkar uh, will highlight some important effects. But also, uh, I, I, I would like to uh, articulate one important information. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the prominence, uh, Assan is a very prominent uh, in, in, in most of the countries. And uh, this, uh, we receive many feedbacks uh, about the application of, replication of Assam model and also, uh, the, how to say, training requests. And our experts uh, now, uh, just uh, as a state agency, we deliver. We are just offering the uh, the, the custom, uh, the tailor-based trainings, and also the soft skill trainings, like a psychological trainings, time management, stress management, and through our uh, just a very uh, how to say uh, experienced uh, experts who have around. 10 years or more than 15 years experience in the field of public administrations. And so far we made, we conducted the trainings for Turkmenistan, Indonesia, and also the regions of the Russian Federation, and also uh, the, some, uh, some uh, companies in Tajikistan. And uh, also we are now uh, offering these trainings via online way as well. So I uh, taking this opportunity, I would like also to thank to the IDB, uh, to the organizers, to Asian Development, to its Carrick Institute, uh, for giving us a chance to present our uh, best experience in the field of public service delivery. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Khudayurdi, for a very comprehensive overview of Asan model. It's uh, very interesting. Um, so, and especially like during the context of, uh, of, uh, of the COVID pandemic, right? Like uh, how you were able to use the system, right? To respond to the challenges uh, faced by the country. Um, in, uh, uh, in our next uh, presentation, uh, Ms. Ulkar Kahramanova, uh, she's uh, she's uh, senior advisor senior advisor on, in the H, uh, human resources department. She's in charge of the talent management, and in her presentation, uh, she will uh, describe like all the various di dimensions of uh, human resource uh, or talent management uh, at Asan Asan service. I mean, uh, as uh, as you've seen like in uh, previous slides in previous presentations, the uh, team of uh, uh, SAPSI. Uh, like uh, which runs 
a sound service is very young, very dynamic, and uh, I, uh, I believe all 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 participants would, would be uh, in, uh, interested to know like how how you run uh, the HR HR aspect or human resources aspect of uh, of uh, Asan 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 service. Uh, Ms. Ulkar, over to you, please. Thank you. Good morning, dear audience, and thank you. Uh, I'm Ülker Gahramanova, and uh, today uh, we will talk about the HR processes that are going in these uh, state agency and the uh, Asan Service Centers. So, next slide, please. Uh, so, the state agency is a central exit. Uh, central body of executive power uh, it are the ones in the circle shaped um, uh, forms and it has the uh, state agency has um, support its subordinate organizations or institutions you may call that carries out the duties and responsibilities of the um, state agency in accordance to the direction of its activities. So we have um, the direction of activities are public service, digital solutions, innovations, and social pro uh, projects. So uh, for public services, we've got uh, Asan service centers. And at the moment, currently we have 21 in overall uh, Asan service centers rendering uh, services to the citizens. And so, uh, six of them are in the capital and um, the rest, the 15 are in the regions. And this year we are planning on launching three more <laughs> one in the capital and two in the regions. And for our social projects, we've got about a public legal entity. Um, my colleague will give more information about that. We've got um, innovation center for the, for the uh, innovations uh, direction and digital solutions, EGOV development center, public legal entity. And uh, you will be informed uh, more about that later. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the state agency and its subord uh, subordinate Assad service centers. You see, we have around um, around just a little more than uh, 4,500 employees in overall. The thing is, uh, the state agency uh, itself has around uh, just a little more than 280 uh, uh, employees itself. And then uh, at the Assad service centers, we've got our own employees and we have employees of the other state bodies and functional auxiliary services. Sometimes, uh, of course, we're all a big Assam family, but unfortunately, sometimes it causes a confusion. They think that uh, we also uh, employ uh, the employees of other state bodies and functional auxiliary services. Unfortunately, that is not the case. But before we go into the details, let me just give you an overall um, uh, statistical information. So gender balance, uh, you know, is very important. Uh, it's uh, it's a, essential to an organization because it's got many benefits like varied perspectives, uh, better cus uh, customer targeting, more comprehensive talent uh, pool, uh, staff increased staff retention, um, improved collaboration. So our gender balance, as you can see, is 53% uh, uh, is male and 47% consists of female. Uh, workers. Our uh, young staff means um, you know, new energy, new perspective, adaptability, and agility. And uh, well, we're proud to say that um, our staff is uh, well around 30, you know, the average age is uh, around 32 years. And young leaders, well, young leaders, uh, they're skilled at uh, inspiring employee uh, employees and getting them excited about uh, accomplishing uh, objectives. And they tend to embrace uh, change, which also means uh, they typically have a lot of ideas and are more optimistic about change. So young leaders, like 61% of our leaders are young leaders, I mean, uh, they're younger than the age of 35. Next slide, please. So yes, yeah, selection and recruitment. As I said, um, the, the state agency and the service centers, they are covered by the civil service law of the Azerbaijan Republic. So uh, how we employ our uh, employees at the state agency and the service centers, so it's, uh, we all well, we have to go in accordance with the civil service. So it's a competition, there's a test, you first have to get the certificate. And then you can, with the certificate, you can apply to any, not only to a civil service, uh, that's actually, but uh, you know, in, to any other state body uh, that has uh, an, um, a vacancy that you, uh, the, the candidate would like to 
uh, apply to. And then there comes a general interview and then uh, that, that's how you um, apply to firstly to become a civil service. And once a uh, civil servant, once you're a civil servant, uh, you want to get a promotion, you want to change your rotation or something, then there are general interviews, internal interviews, and then um, we've got reserve personnel. Those are the ones who uh, have passed uh, the uh, interviews but who couldn't uh, uh, be assigned. So uh, we keep them in reserve personnel for two years. And if any vacancy uh, appears during that time, we um, assign them. And then there's and of course, a code of labor, it's always the go-go. And the employees of other state entities, see, this is the fun part. Um, they are employed, uh, they are the employees of their own uh, state bodies, relevant state entities, and they're recruited in accordance with their own um, uh, regulations. And so what we do is we ask, uh, we, we first um analyze how many uh, employees uh, we need uh, from you know the um, other state bodies and then uh, we ask those uh, state bodies to uh, second their um, employees to the self-service centers and they work as uh, my colleague said before uh, we make sure we uh, control, monitor, and supervise that those workers, uh, they uh, work uh, in accordance with our standards, our guidelines. And it's the same with the employees of the functional subsidiary services. Um, next slide, please. Right, so orientation and adaptation. Well, as you know, uh, the adaptation, well, to work, uh, uh, well, it's an, it's a, um, work is an important period to start like newly start working is an important period in life of an employee and its aim is to uh, the pro the aim of the uh, orientation adaptation process is to help uh, the newly employed person adopt and accept the ways the habits the values of the organization the process of introducing a new employee to work um, is mainly to familiarize the employee with the organization of work in the company organizational culture procedures and also the values of the organization as just said uh, all this is to ensure a fast and proper process of adaptation on which will depend the future work and efficiency uh, and expectations of the employee. So uh, it's a two month period at the state agency and the sun service centers. And it is, uh, we figured out that the best way to um, the, the best way for the uh, adaptation process to have its effect is through uh, mentoring. So uh, like it's usually the head of the unit or the department that is mentoring the newly uh, uh, that the new employee and we've got our uh, procedures like um, uh, all the um, new information he has to uh, he has to um, know he has to fam get familiarized with and uh, we also have a little um, appraisal uh, at the end of those two months period just to you know uh, make sure uh, it's, it's actually more for the employee uh, himself to uh, it's a kind of a checklist so that he knows if his uh, if he's comprehended uh, the processes the um, all the documentations and the job itself at the end of the two months and during these two uh, months adaptation of course there's no uh uh appraisal performance appraisal nothing of that kind just an appraisal for you know self-appraisal at the end uh to um eliminate paper usage so it's all automated uh it's all through our online hr system which i'll um talk uh, later on. So, and this uh, orientation adaptation um, process, it has, it's divided into like uh, three um, uh, stages. First, it's like the organization-wide uh, orientation, and then the departmental uh, orientation, and then the job, uh, specific job position uh, orientation. Um, next slide, please. Right. So performance appraisal, I'm sure you've heard many times uh, uh, about the importance of performance appraisal, so I will not even uh, go to that. What I've written here is the purposes of the uh, performance appraisal, the purposes that it should carry. So for example, like regulatory uh, means that 
employees they should know uh, what is expected of them uh, um, they should know how they're expected to work like corrective it's uh, means it's like a, a the uh, performance appraisal should be a process of communicating with the employee to improve behavior and performance like um, reflecting uh, it should be a way of studying uh, the, uh, like uh, your own experience to improve the way you work I'm, I'm talking about in the sense of the employee developing like uh, it, the performance appraisal should help uh, identify the strengths and weaknesses uh, of an employee and address how to improve or develop these um, areas uh, motivating an employee performance appraisal should be uh, should act as a motivation for uh, the employee to improve his uh, or her productivity when an employee sees his goals clearly um, defined his performance challenges identified and career development solutions in place to help advance his career. The effect is to motivate uh, the employee to achieve those goals. And um, retrospective, so performance reviews, uh, that these are very important. Uh, uh, they give both the company and uh, well um, your employee to, uh, your employees important feedback. They provide the opportunity for your employees to receive recognition for the job uh, well done or to highlight areas that may need more um, attention. And uh, protection, prognostic ter termination, uh, sometimes. Um, uh, performance appraisals help us um, see and realize who, unfortunately, uh, we have we should uh, part our paths with. Um, next slide, please. And as you know, there are many kinds of um, mm, performance appraisals. There are traditional and modern ways, like straight ranking method, uh, 360 degrees uh, feedback, bars, critical incident method, paired comparison checklist, and so many. And while we were uh, working on our appraisal system at the state, uh, state agency, we figured out it's, uh, it should be something tailored to our needs and our responsibilities and our uh, specifics. So, and since we are covered also by the uh, civil service uh, law, uh, there is an annual uh, obligatory uh, uh, appraisal of the civil servants. It's done at the end of the um, each uh, year. That's uh, due to the um, civil service uh, law. That's one thing. And then we have internal one, so uh, uh, which is monthly appraisal based on daily monitoring. Next slide, please. So what it is, is basically um, we, we each employee uh, is given like 75 points uh, at the start of the uh, uh, each month and we've got a uh, job uh, job specific criteria and so the main goal is to at least keep that 75 points or go higher and uh, the assessment relies on facts um, on observations on another uh, facts um, discovered during the appraisal uh, period and the points may be deducted or given uh, or those defects uh, that are detected they may be uh, excused. Next slide please. Right so motivation uh, what is motivation I'm sure all you know it's it, the enthusiasm the energy level the commitment and the amount of uh, created creativity an employee uh, brings to the organization to the uh, institution on a daily basis so in order to build uh, a rewarding uh, employee experience uh, you need to understand what matters most to your uh, people so uh, we've got um, uh, well, we divide our uh, motivators into two groups, financial and non-financial. So we've got bonuses, we've got monetary rewards, uh, 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 that's for the financial motivators. And as for non-financial motivators, uh, we have we give the employees the, uh, the chance to become the employee of the month. And then once they, they become the uh, employee of the month, of course, they're given some monetary lump sum. And uh, uh, in addition, what matters the most to them is that their uh, picture and their story is shared on our, our social platforms. And then we give them personal growth opportunities. Uh, opportunities. We have um, trainings, international uh, uh, trainings conducted by international trainers. We got recognition, job enlargement, uh, and then uh, working environment. We tend to um, organize events, uh, social events, um, and you know meetings with uh, the uh, administration of this uh, state agency, and so on. Next slide, please. Right, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my um, train. Uh, 
presentation, Human Resource Management Information System. So um, the importance and benefits of having this uh, human, resource, uh, human resources information system within an organization uh, are, are, are there's, there are countless of them. It makes finding and managing information easier for the HR, not only for the HR, but actually for everyone uh, within the organization. Uh, with all the information in a single database, it's easier for HR to find the information they need, track how to uh, handle and update it when necessary. Uh, see, during the uh, daily uh, basis, um, like the HR has to transfer information between multiple software systems or software and paper files, and uh, thus errors inevitably creep in. Using one single system eliminates that problem as more functions are automated. There's less need for manual data entry, which also reduces errors. And so, and you know, paper files are easy to access, even by, even by people who have no right to the information. And so, the system can restrict the access to those who need. And also, uh, uh, you'd be um, not using, you know, maybe uh, many uh, paper. Uh, accurate time off and the unused balance are easier and faster um, to track and adjust within the computer than with this uh, spreadsheet. Um, and uh, well, another uh, another important thing, it's uh, it makes it easier for uh, not only for HR, but again for everyone to generate reports. And one more thing that it that it has been very useful for us, as I mentioned, we have 15 Asan service centers in the regions. So we have with this system, we have eliminated the geographical distance. So for example, if uh, the employee needs to turn in his newly acquired document, he doesn't have to drive all the way <clears throat> to the state agency to the capital. Uh, rather, he can just upload it in, uh, in his files and his profile that, okay, there's a new file or there are some new changes. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, training on Assan. Um, so um, the objective uh, of, of the trainings at Assan is to develop comprehensive, uh, efficient, flexible, and innovative training system in the agency with modern training standards and infrastructure, and to form personnel uh, with professional national moral capacities, loyal to corporate values of the state agency and own uh, creative thinking uh, ability. Next slide, please. So um, we have um, personal development uh, trainings uh, that those are you know, in the field of IT, law, security, software skills, and also psychological or soft skills like stress management, conflict management, active listening, adaptability, growth mindset, emotional intelligence, um, team building. And there are actually some uh, uh, many more um, uh, to this. And uh, next slide, please. And yes, as uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Khodavedi uh, mentioned before, we have international trainings. They are tailored trainings um, uh, for the, um, tailored for the needs of our um, counterparts uh, on topics of citizen satisfaction, Assam values and our experiences and also human resources and training. So these are uh, just some of the um, countries uh, we've had uh, partnerships with uh, in terms of uh, we, we've delivered uh, trainings to them. Um, next slide, please. Right, and forms of trainings, yeah, they can be in groups uh, or individual trainings. Uh, we use the intranet, uh, we use the, our Assange uh, radio uh, for inter, um, trainings. Uh, we have online trainings uh, that is uh, not on, just online, but also through our um, um, HR systems. And of course, uh, through our uh, mobile applications as well. And next slide, if I'm not, right. Yes, thank you for the time. I hope I'm not over it. Um, any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Kahramanova. Uh, I believe uh, it, was, it was very, very, very interesting and uh, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I believe we are on track in terms of time, uh, but I, I wanted to remind uh, all uh, the participants that uh, we will have a, a short Q&A session 
in the meanwhile, like if you have any specific questions to our uh, uh, speakers, uh, please go ahead. Uh, we should be able to respond uh, to your uh, uh, any uh, we, to come up with any clarification uh, needed. Right. So uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Ruslan Akbarov. He is head of uh, monitoring and assessment uh, unit uh, at Asan. So basically, uh, he he is an expert in policy analysis uh, and uh, in charge of in, in introducing in, in innovative policies at Asan. Uh, he uh, basically his job is to make sure that uh, Asan services right like stays uh, up 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 to date and uh, responds to the needs of the population of Azerbaijan. Uh, Ms. Dr. Akbarov has a PhD in political science. And uh, uh, here, uh, uh, Dr. Akbarov, I just wanted to uh, highlight one point that, uh, you know, like there's a, there's a quote, there's a saying that, uh, you know, like the most important uh, customers are those who are dissatisfied. Uh, but uh, earlier we uh, learned that uh, satisfaction rate uh, is uh, more than 99%, right, uh, with your services. My question uh, is that how how do you make sure that uh, you know like uh, Asan uh, st stays uh, proactive, right? As again, as most mentioned by uh, you know uh, distinguished colleagues uh, from Asan service, uh, that, uh, 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 in your presentation we'd really appreciate if you could just uh, describe some of the mechanisms that uh, you know like, that you use, right, uh, to uh, to ensure like uh, you know. Uh, um, you know, a connection with your clients, right? And making sure that uh, you uh, respond to their uh, needs or anticipate, you know, like new developments and, uh, you know, like emerging emerging services. Over to you, uh, Dr. Agbarov. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind presentation, Mr. Aminov. Um, greetings from Azerbaijan to all the participants and uh, to my colleagues too. So if you let me just screen the share, All right, here we go. So um, today we'll talk about the monitoring and assessment, which is um, how we implement monitoring and assessment at the Sun Service Center in order to, uh, to learn the current uh, situation and if necessary, to take some proactive uh, measures. Am I clearly heard? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. So uh, let me start with the uh, goals of Assange Service Center. There, there, there are several goals there with the Assange Service Centers. So some of them is improvement services rendered by state entities, acceleration of the transition process to e-services, ensuring ethical, uh, ethical rules and flood treatment towards citizens, and delivering the services in more positive, comfortable, and a new way with the application of modern uh, innovations. This is the uh, main goals of, of the establishment of Assam uh, service centers. So before going to deep detail about the monitoring and assessment, just let me explain you the structural unit of the, uh, the, of the de department. Uh, Mrs. Gahramanova also mentioned that the state agency consists of the several departments. One of the departments uh, is the uh, monitoring and assessment department. This department consists of the several divisions, monitoring divisions, assessment, provision mobile assistance service and situation center. So I will, uh, I will just uh, step by step explain the, each the, uh, division. So uh, one of them is like, I will start with the monitoring division too. So the generally this department is responsible for the application, is generally responsible for the coordination and management of a sun service center in the country. So. Uh, the main directions is application of the services carried out by different uh, state organization on privilege basis, applying a uh, single window principle. So all the services uh, are supposed to be uh, rendered according to the legislation, in the, according to the legal acts of the particular service. So, and then another direction is that to oversee the application of the services provided in the centers with the principles of the efficiency, transparency, courtesy, responsibility, and comfort. This applies for all Assam service center and follows uh, to all the services. And also provision of uh, mobile Assam service center where Assam service centers are absent. So this includes the uh, rural areas, 
So uh, during the some of the necessary uh, days, you know, to the citizens that you know they have difficulties to uh, visit the Assam Service Center, and also to the to the citizens that uh, is like VIP is like this is other based uh, mobile service that you know you can without leaving your office or the home, so you can just order the uh, mobile Assam to your office or home or wherever. You want. So, monitoring and assessment uh, is conducted based on the monitoring assessment regulations of the state agency. This is legal act. So, this legal act uh, includes all the steps, what, uh, what should be taken into account, what kind of uh, principles and, and what kind of uh, measures which can we take in every uh, situation. So how do we monitor? So the observations are conducted by the responsible persons assigned by the department in the following directions. What does it mean? In my next slides, I will uh, explain in more detail that we have the supervisors of the monitoring division. We, the supervisor is responsible for several centers and uh, everything about the uh, everything happens in the service center. These persons are monitoring uh, monitors. They they, they keep the track of the statistics and the violations if yes if if, if available and uh, and any other uh, the issues that are related to the particular uh, center so obedience of established principles and rules by the centers so it's like the legal acts that each service center they ha we have and also internal guidelines and regulations that you know supposed to be uh, uh, followed by the centers too. So rendering of another uh, direction is that rendering the, of service occurs with the law. Corruption offenses. As Mr. Kulaverdi also mentioned in his presentation uh, earlier that uh, Assam service centers are zero corruption uh, place. Why is that? So there is no direct payments to the service centers, to the servicemen at the, cent uh, at the windows. So all the services are conducted through the bank. So in, uh, it's uh, installed in every uh, the service area. Compliance with the rules of ethical behavior by employee and the profession of the staff and service levels. So how will, after when we monitor the professions of the staff and service levels, Ms., uh, Mrs. Kahramanova also mentioned in his presentation, we we provide the trainings to uh, our to the employees of the Assam Service Center and also to the representatives of the state entities. So, by the way, all the services are rendered by the relevant state entities, by the representative of the relevant state entities. Assam, Assam only provides the services, organizes the services, and ensures their service quality. So, we talked about uh, all these ones. So. So how would you organize the monitoring at the center too? If necessary, uh, reception of citizens in person, regardless which service they apply. So if we use this, uh, if there is a, a complaint uh, or uh, unsatisfied citizens uh, that, that apply to some service center. Investigation and reply to incoming requests from persons and organizations. Provision of monitoring at the centers in person, so, uh, as I said earlier, um, supervisors, they visit uh, regularly uh, the, um, the, the center that they are responsible for. Monitoring and statistics regarding the number of applications and, uh, and provide the services on a daily basis. So, we have uh, the statistics system, we have the monitoring and assessment system. So which, which we can keep track of the, uh, how many citizens apply to one particular service service or one uh, particular Assam center. And uh, the employees, we can, op uh, we can monitor the, uh, which employee uh, received, um, I mean, the served the citizen and how many the services documents are issued and et cetera. Conducting a regular and periodic surveys in order to reveal the customer satisfaction uh, level. As Mr. Raminov also mentioned that the satisfaction rate at the Sound Service Center is 99.5%. Uh, 
So we apply the different uh, sur surveys. We get maximum feedback from citizens in order to understand the, uh, the problems, the issues, and, uh, and do our best to uh, overcome these ones. And investigation of violations, if there's enough ground for it. So during the uh, complete management part, I will, I will go in deep details uh, regarding this, um, uh, I mean, this one, this means. So registration of the violations committed by employees. So each registration, each violation are registered in the system. So even after three years or two years, we can check what kind of uh, violations uh, occurred and who did this and, and what kind of measures are taken. So this, we use also these uh, statistics to, uh, to provide training to particular uh, employee or staff member. Information on registered violations are reported to the department on a daily and weekly basis. So uh, monitoring assessment department conducts general um general monitoring and the and the the the, the, uh, the particular divisions of the server centers they are uh, conducting the direct monitoring so i will talk about this one next in next slides so daily statistics uh, about the even the violations also uh, sent to the our department to the supervisors in case of the employee to be proven in charge of the violation, warning or notice will be issued about him or her. So there are two types of warning, is that oral warning and the written warning. And notice, the written warning and oral warning, uh, I mean, the notice also affects their assessment and which is also uh, affects their, uh, the commission too. It's like the financial impact also, you know, we, uh, we apply is like for the, uh, uh, excellent service also is extra points, and uh, for the violations, uh, deductive points also affects their uh, income too. In order to conduct a full and objective investigation, the relevant documents are examined by the presence of the relevant persons involved. If there is, in it, if is, if it, if it's necessary, so the documents are also uh, uh, asked from the service centers, even the from the person who served uh, that also these documents will may also require from the relevant uh, state body too. So another monitoring we have is that, so in order to uh, apply the uh, unified corporate standards, we also have another the different type of monitoring, which is uh, consists of the uh, more than 320 uh, the criteria. Uh, this is used to ensure the consistency, uh, constantly high level of service condition at some service center, and also to improve the service quality through the elimination of gaps in the some service center. So, what is that? What's the, this monitoring? This monitoring is also starts from the. Uh, the staffs, uh, the uniform up to the uh, equipment uh, at the service center and includes the booklets and brochures. So this is the standard for each Asana service center they, they should have in order to provide the comfortable uh, service area too. So there are 20, 323 cri monitoring criteria. Uh, once in every three months is this monitoring is conducted by our department by the supervisor, and every month, once in every month, by the service center, by the by the center, and also they sent the report to the to the department to the supervisor to, to supervisor too. Shortcomings advice and monitoring of the important cases uh, where the uh, monitoring report. So uh, every details uh, are mentioned in the report, and then uh, we send it to the relevant department if necessary to to solve the problem to the issue. As I said before, your general monitoring, we have general monitoring and direct monitoring. So monitoring assessment department of the state agency is responsible for the general monitoring and uh, through the supervisors. As some service center, they, they are responsible for the direct monitoring. And situation center, as I said before, do have another division. Situation center uh, mon monitors the service centers through the surveillance cameras. And uh, if there is the, uh, any violations or offenses are uh, registered, is this, this sends to, uh, to the relevant uh, center and they investigate and then uh, give a feedback uh, to the uh, division too. 
So supervisors, currently there are 21 Asan, Asan service centers and two Asan utility centers and plus Asan mobile service. Each supervisor is responsible for the several uh, centers that, as I said before, is like data statistics, uh, about the applications of the citizens' applications, about the complaints, suggestions, even the uh, greetings to the, from, for, for the service. So, direct monitoring. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Akbarov, if I could ask you to kindly wrap, wrap your pre presentation in the next maybe uh, two or three minutes, please, because right. we are a bit short in time, okay? Ah, okay. So, thank you let so me much. just thank go you. to more detail about the uh, the trainings also we have informed. Complete management system, we use the maximum sources to get the feedbacks from the citizens. This includes, we actually developed this one during the pandemic as a mobile app. So the app citizens could get information, could also apply to the Sun service center because there were the restrictions, the uh, number of uh, citizens to serve in a, in a day with the uh, uh, interval of 15 or 20 minutes that, you know, not to enough uh, more crowd at the, some, at the center too. So through the mobile app, you can get information uh, about the services. You can make complaint, make suggestions, and also apply to the service, so, uh, services too. So and it also shows that, you know, how many citizens are on the queue. So uh, when's your time, when, when you need to go to go to the service center. So it shows you that the exact date and the time that, you know, you, you need to apply to the some service center. So you don't need to come and wait here for like 15 minutes or 20 minutes or more than this. Direct application by the citizens. So if you are at the sound service center and you have a complaint, so you can uh, directly to apply to the responsible person at the sound service centers and, and make your complaint. If that your problem is uh, can be solved at the, at, at the moment, so it's solved. If not, so you get the, your uh, you write down your application and then we send it to the relevant authorities to, to get this solved. So we are uh, highly active on social media. So appeals via social media, we, we accept the proposals, complaints, and even any feedback that you know is, is available by the citizens too. Even the comments are also registered. Appeals receive call center. So the call center, you can also get the information about the services, apply to a sound service center, take queue, and make complaints too. Application is the, the book of complaints and suggestions. So actually what's that, you know, the difference you, yeah, the, we have the electronic uh, complaints means and we have the paper, paper uh, based, uh, I mean the feedback system means. So what's that for? So there are generations that, you know, they are mostly uses the uh, electronic versions. I mean, the online uh, feedbacks. So some of them that, you know, the non-internet uh, non users, they, you know, it's easy for the older people to write down and, you know, directly may make the complaints. So, so that's why we take into account the, all the uh, ages of the population. <coughs> Email also, we get the information and the surveys. What's the survey is that? Two types of surveys. One survey is periodic survey. Periodic surveys is used for the custom satisfaction rate. No later than three months for 15 days, we conduct a survey in every uh, in different Asan service center. So within the 15 days, what kind of information we gather? So we measure the satisfaction rate too. And, uh, and another and assessment. So assessment, we also apply the methodology 75 points that are given to the uh, each staff member. So they get the normal salary, normal commission. So if there are violations that, you know, if you receive the, I mean, the, uh, the notice, for example, the notice. So there, are, depending on the violation, there are deductible points. Deductible points also affects the, the commission that you get. So it's like financial part. So, and also if you are, ex, you have your excellent service. So it's like, there are different types of the, the categories, parameters that, you know, we give the extra points, we extra points you also get the extra commission too. So it's also the fi financial uh, impact we, we apply to this one. So it's like 20, maximum 25 points can be get. And there are several parameters that, you know, uh, for the distinguished uh, services where pleasant satisfaction. So if there is the citizen saying that, you know, thank you very much to that person, that, you know, he excellently solved my, pro solved my problem. So it's, like, it's, it's also, you know, excuse for us to, give the extra point to the, to the uh, relevant, um, uh, to particular uh, employee. Ethical behavior in hard situations, 
efficiency, participation in the social e e events or uh, initiativeness. So if you give the suggestion proposal that, you know, is, is like, like efficient, so it's like applied, we also, you know, uh, assess, on, assess this one. So, so mobile service, we have 10 buses, one train, eight mobile groups and one uh, mobile VIP mobile service that, you know, regularly they are visiting the citizens in the rural areas where the sensory center is absent, so they serve the citizens, you know. Even I can say that, you know, through the mobile sound service, we we get more services, more the citizen satisfaction, uh, satisfaction uh, compared to one, for example, uh, a sound service center. Imagine that one, to one part of sound service, we have the 3,000, 3,500 uh, appeals in Baku, in the regions is like, like 1,500, but this, through the Assam buses, we get uh, like the, even the similar to the uh, regional Assam service center. So, uh, I tried to wrap up quickly within two, three minutes. There are Excellent. A, lot, Excellent. a lot to talk about, but we have the yeah. limited time. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akbarov. Just very quickly, we have one question from Mr. Uh, Zakaria Hanafi. Uh, okay. In one minute, your answer, please. Uh, to what extent is innovations uh, driven by the public sector? Do SMEs uh, ac or academia or uh, civil society uh, 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 in Azerbaijan contribute to introducing innovative solutions dri uh, driven by the market, by, by the market needs and global trends? Um, we, we have Idea Bank uh, of our own government organization. We get the feedback I mean, the, from the citizens, so what they want. So we also uh, cooperate with international organizations also into uh, the different uh, models in the worldwide. So we try to uh, use and apply best practice. So what's suitable for the, uh, how, uh, to the citizens. So, so it's like mostly the ideas from the citizens, they are, they, you know, uh, eliminate, they evaluate, and then we, uh, we apply the, to the services. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Akbarov. So, I mean, uh, we uh, in the in the second webinar, uh, we'll have uh, we'll discuss in detail next week all these uh, aspects. So, like uh, for this session, because of time, like we have to wrap up. Uh, Brother Ahmad, like over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you. to all speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much, Brother Kokurjan, for moderating this session, and uh, many thanks to our speakers. I will now turn it uh, over to uh, uh, Mr. Ali Khan, who's the Country Operations Manager in the Almaty Hub, uh, to introduce the next session uh, on the best practice of state support to small businesses through digital platforms. Uh, just also being mindful of the time, so if we can all stick to uh, our uh, times for the presentations, that will be very appreciated. Thank you so much, and Ali, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Ahmed, can you confirm if my video is fine? Your video is fine, but the lighting, I think there's a problem with the light. Uh, Ishraq, if you can advise, please. Uh, I would suggest to remove the background. Yeah, I did just use use the use a regular, you know, just your own background, please. Uh, maybe that's causing the problem. Uh, did it get better? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, I think we are getting to the end of the seminar, but certainly, in my opinion, perhaps the most important session uh, which is coming up now, considering that we will be talking about the SMEs, which I think, especially these days uh, with the impact of COVID, uh, and the huge unemployment that many of our member countries have experienced. Uh, many people would have a question that how does all this come together to support the SME sector? How does it generate the employment? Uh, so I think in that context, uh, we would have very exciting discussion today. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, I would quickly introduce the panel that we have. We have Dr. Ghulam Samad. He's a senior research specialist at Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, CARAC. Before joining Carrick Institute, Dr. Samad was a senior research economist at the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, PIED. Uh, Dr. Samad, he holds a PhD in economics from Colorado State University, and he has worked as a consultant with various international organizations, including the World Bank, UNDP, 
WTO, UNEP. Uh, I, I would go ahead and introduce the other panelists as well. Uh, we have, uh, I think, perhaps the, 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 one of the most important people from uh, Assan today with us, uh, Ms. Laman Ahmado. Uh, she has been working as the head of the Marketing International uh, and Public Relations Department of the Abad Pe Public Legal Entity. Uh, it was slightly hinted to in the previous presentation by one of the pre presenters. Uh, she holds a master's degree in public administration from the Academy of Public Administration under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. She has worked for the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations uh, as, a lead, as a leading consultant in human resources and training department. Besides that, she has managed Career Center of Azan Volunteers, Asan Keda. Uh, the last but not the least, we have our own colleague from the regional hub of Almaty, bro, Brother Samir Tagiev. Uh, Brother Samir, he is the head of the CIS and Europe region for the relationship management and partnership development of uh, Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, an entity of the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, he brings in 20 years of banking experience in emerging markets, working with top banks, established private equity funds and Islamic leasing companies and Islamic banks in CIS and Europe. So very rich experience from the financial side of things uh, when we talk about the SMEs. He's currently the board member of Asar Leasing Company, Tajikistan and Taiba Leasing, Uzbekistan. Uh, uh, and he holds an MBA degree from Durham Business School, UK. Uh, with this uh, rather quick introduction, uh, we would just to set the context, uh, we will start with Dr. Ghulam Samad. Uh, and I would have a question with him, which hopefully he would answer with the elaborative presentation. Dr. Samad, to set the context, uh, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the SMEs? Uh, and how has the support, how has the state supported them during this uh, pandemic? And thank you so much, uh, Ali, uh, and, and I hope uh, you can have all these answers in my presentation. So just to confirm, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, we, uh, have you shared the screen? Yes, I, I did. Uh, no, right now we are seeing your video. I can't see okay. the... Okay, now it's coming. Okay, we can see it. Please go ahead. But can you see the uh, slide notes as well, or just the presentation, the overall further one? Right now, we are just seeing the presentation, not the notes. Okay, great. Okay, okay. great. Thank you so much, uh, Ali and police, for the uh, invitation. Uh, I will be going to uh, present the uh, COVID-19 impacts in a coping strategy. Uh, that was a joint study with ADB colleagues. Uh, just to set the uh, context for the uh, presentation, uh, this survey was a launch in uh, December 2020 and it was completed in January 2021. Uh, we had a survey for uh, about 1,000 uh, firms across the four countries, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Georgia. And the benchmark for the analysis was, uh, we thought the uh, COVID was erupted in March, though we had a definition problem there. So that was all about the um, uh, kind of uh, method methodology that has been involved here. But probably for this analysis, uh, we had studied what effect business disruption had caused uh, by the COVID-19. And then also we had a discussion about what were the uh, coping strategies uh, from the uh, MSMEs and then what government interventions uh, were there for the MSMEs across the four countries. And of course, we end up with the lesson learned uh, by the policymakers. So next slide is about the sequence of my presentation where I'm going to discuss the broader introduction. Um, then I will walk you through the uh, state of the MSMEs across the four countries, but definitely we can relate it to the across the Kerry countries. And then uh, particularly, I will be focusing on the uh, professional impacts and then the revenue impacts, employment and minutes with the coping strategies. So um, broadly, we, we are all aware that how this pandemic has erupted the uh, MSMEs. So it's basically the impact was from the consumer spending and then from the production kind of uh, halting activities that has uh, broadly not only affected the larger uh, firms, but the smaller firms as well. And similarly, if we look into the structure of the businesses of the MSMEs across the Kerry countries, then again, the amplification uh, for the MSMEs 
over there. Similarly, um, the significance of the amplified impact of the COVID-19 for the MSMEs, those who are more integrated or with the uh, disrupted economies, especially for the economies uh, where this um, pandemic has been uh, originated. So the impact was again uh, for the MSMEs or larger for the integrated economy and for those MSMEs economies across the four countries, those were less integrated and these uh, with the shock economies, of course, it was uh, lesser impacted. Uh, a lot of literature uh, across the regional economies has been seen they have forecasted and projected that the MSMEs has been uh, largely impacted uh, by the COVID-19 impact. So based on this whole analysis, uh, we had an uh, analysis for the state of the MSMEs across the four countries. And uh, clearly, you guys can see it, MSMEs have a substantial share in the economies. It is almost 90% for the registered businesses in these four economies. Uh, but if you look into the uh, GDP contribution of the MSMEs in these four economies, it has been higher for the Georgia, which is about 61%, uh, followed by the rest of the economy. But one thing from this uh, slide, you guys can see that the low share of the MSMEs in the GDP broadly indicates the structure of the economies. They are still dominated by the large enterprises and by the strong state-owned enterprises. Uh, the second slide is again uh, about the state of the MSMEs economies, and I do think it's important to see the impact analysis, which is about the uh, breakdown of the sectoral structure of the MSMEs across the uh, four economies. And again, clearly for the rest of these economies, we can see the distribution of the manufacturing and the services for these economies. Uh, again, um, for Georgia, we can clearly see uh, where the services sector has been standing. And for the rest of the economies, for example, Uzbekistan, where broader contribution has been from manufacturing. Let me clear one thing here for a manufacturing, we do include it here for the analysis, the agriculture sector as well. So broadly in this analysis, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan has been dominated in the manufacturing sector. But for the rest, Georgia stand out uh, significant in terms of the services sector. Uh, the third state of the MSME, I do think it's important to understand the employment condition or the total employment shares of these economies. And again, the strong dominance uh, of the large private and the store or state owned enterprises that I already indicated has been again obvious here. For the total share of the employment has been dominated by Pakistan's almost 80% contribution by the MSMEs. Uh, uh, is, is, is by the MSMEs in the total employment and followed by the uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and the Georgian economy. Uh, the uh, last slide about the state of the MSMEs economies is about the orientation or the operation of these MSMEs businesses. And I think this is one of the important slides to see where the care countries who are in particularly these four economies have been standing. If you look into the exports and the imports uh, activities, uh, only Pakistan has been, like, uh, still the, the, the share has been uh, significantly low, it's been around 14%. Those MSMEs have been kind of engagement with the export and import kind of activities. But the rest of the economies did not show significant share of the export and import activities. And this is one thing uh, that, is, uh, that I already alluded and highlighted at the beginning, that integration of the MSMEs are very important to understand the impacts of the COVID-19 on the MSME sector. So if we look into the operational uh, overall broader impact, uh, we can uh, see that I, I do highlight it that the uh, international market volatility has been there, but unfortunately, and fortunately for some of these MSMEs, it has not been impacted because of the less integration. Uh, similarly, as we look into the detailed analysis, Georgia was one of the economies who has been impacted largely by the COVID-19. And because of the business nature and the structure of their orientation of their economies are uh, towards the international markets. That is one of the reasons that why we can, in the next slide, I can show you that Georgia is significantly impacted by the COVID-19 impact. But again, the different indicators, here you guys can see it. On the left side, we have a reduced demand for, for goods and services. You guys can see the international demand for goods and services, termination of sales and contracts. All those different indicators for the rest of the economies have been, have been studied. 
And for the orange line, that is for the Georgia economy, and the yellow is for Pakistan, and the rest, the blue is for Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, you guys can see that the uh, Georgia economy has been significantly impacted by the reduction of the domestic demand for goods and services. And similarly, the next significant impact on the Georgia economy is, is, is from the uh, temporary closure of their business. But for the rest of their economy, uh, they are standing somewhere in the middle. This was one of the significant findings uh, from the analysis that we had so far. Let me quickly uh, walk you through the uh, revenue impact. And again, we had a different kind of uh, scenarios for the revenue impact, but again, the orange one is for the Georgia, which shows that 44% of their MSMEs, they highlighted that their revenue had been significantly, more than 50% had been uh, decreased. And we do have a number for the rest of the economy. And if you look and focus on the last bar, that is no change. Again, for the Uzbekistan, uh, the oral impact, then then comes the revenue loss. Uzbekistan economy stand out better than the rest of the economies considered for this analysis. So again, for the revenue impact, we can see the Georgia has been uh, significantly impacted, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the economies uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan are not being impacted, but the intensity, the magnitude is, as compared to Georgia is low. The, this, this slide is about the employment conditions. Again, um, uh, based on the analysis, uh, we had seen that the COVID-19 impact on the oral employment conditions has not been significant. Though we do have a different coping mechanism, and I, I do think that the MSMEs across the country had a very smart move here. They had like a working hour decrease of coping strategy. Then they had a salary in which uh, suspension or decrease of strategies. They went for a more remote work kind of strategies. They went for a more sick leave and working hour increase kind of strategies. So those are the different coping mechanisms where MSMEs had adapted themselves for, for, uh, to overcome the uh, negative consequences of the COVID-19 impact. So clearly from this analysis, the laid out of the, the implies were not significant across these four countries, but though the coping mechani mechanism was there, and we can see for Pakistan had a, had a significant coping mechanism, which is about uh, reducing their working hours for, for across the MSMEs. And of course, for the rest of the different indicators that I just highlighted, so these are the coping mechanisms that had been adopted across the MSMEs in these countries uh, to overcome the negative consequences of the, uh, of the COVID-19. Again, here uh, we can clearly see that what would be the strategies? How is a coping with the impact of the COVID-19 disruption uh, been there? And how these MSMEs have been um, uh, uh, developing a different strategies, I would say. So the fundamental strategies, and then uh, I'm going to highlight in the next slide, but clearly from this graphic, uh, you guys can see, the first one that came to us from the analysis was the finding new customers. And again, this has come from the less integration of the Eric MSMEs, uh, because we were not integrated and we, we don't have any other options. So the finding new customers, and again, for the Georgia uh, economy, it's been significant there, but for the rest of the economy, uh, followed by Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan, been there. So new customer finding was the, one of the coping strategies in the different uh, fiscal measure, I would say, that I highlighted on the left side, that is about the different payments, different taxes, and kind of different uh, you know, strategies that have been highlighted there. So these were the different fiscal considerations that has been um, there so that uh, different kind of, uh, I would say, uh, breathing space can be provided to the MSMEs. So you guys are here, let me a little bit highlight uh, these uh, uh, different strategies. Based on our findings and based on our analysis, we highlighted that the, uh, the MSMEs uh, uh, had impacted because of demand and from the supply side as well. But uh, the, 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 the benefit uh, with the MSMEs, they were less integrated uh, with the rest of the economy. So they focused more uh, on, the, on the generation or the operation uh, for the increase in the new buyers or, the, or, or different channels, I would say, so that they can basically enhance or boost uh, their, their production. Uh, similarly, a sizable fiscal uh, support that was proposed uh, not only for the MSMEs, but for the human uh, being as well, so that they can increase their purchasing power, uh, power as well.
But unfortunately, the support that was provided to the MSMEs and to the uh, household, I would say, is was unlimited or untargeted. So the focus should be on the structure of the MSMEs, and those structure support should be targeted so that the coping strategies that is required to overcome the COVID-19 should be should be enhanced. And finally, uh, uh, broadly, I would say. Um, yeah, the potassium pole has been discussed. The so next one is here. Uh, the, this one is the last slide. Uh, the fiscal uh, stimulus measure that I highlighted at the beginning was there, but unfortunately, those fiscal support measures were untargeted and the magnitude was also low. Similarly, the other government support in terms of the tax relief that has been provided, but still uh, that was uh, limited, I would say, in terms of the magnitude and other support from the rest of the Donors, I would say, and from the uh, from the family and friends, were solicited to overcome the COVID-19 impact. Now, to overcome the COVID-19 negative consequences, the government and businesses strategies were to explore new potential customers, sales channel, and shift to online trade. This one, the biggest recommendation so far we had for the for for the MSME is that the digital transformation is the key coping mechanism. They need to be adapted across the MSME so that the transition to the online state and sales can be possible. But based on Dr. Kaiser's earlier presentation, we had a studies for the digital transformation for the CARIC countries where, he, where we had a discussion on infrastructure and regulatory mechanism. Unfortunately, most of the CARIC countries, except China, they are not standing in par with the required indicators that has been again mentioned in Dr. Abbas in their opening presentation. So let me conclude here. Uh, the coping strategies uh, would be uh, these MSMEs need to increase the domestic demand for goods and services by exploring new potential customers and same channels. Second is they need a sizable and targeted fiscal support. Third point is about enhancing regional MSMEs integration. Unfortunately, most of these MSMEs are less integrated. And I mentioned uh, in one of my slides where we are standing uh, in terms of regional integration that come from us with the export and the import integration uh, values. And then again, very important thing, we need a collective uh, collecting of a timely data on MSMEs for a developing a coping strategies. And data collection is one of the biggest, I would say, challenge. And I do uh, believe one of our colleagues in, the, in their opening remarks highlighted the value of the data collection. And finally, uh, the data, the digital transformation is the key for the success of the MSMEs across the, uh, uh, the, the carry countries for the MSMEs. So there, uh, Ali, I stop here and looking forward for the discussion and Q&A. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gulam. That was a very interesting presentation to set the context, and I think that provides a natural transition to the to the next presentation uh, that we have because you have mentioned a couple of uh, measures which the which need to be implemented, as you said, finding new uh, customers, targeted support that we need to provide to the MSMEs, integrated MSMEs with the regional markets, and most importantly, the digitization platform which can uh, which can provide uh, the, the, the access to all these new customers and integrate these MSMEs to the new markets. Uh, now, uh, we hope that uh, in the form of a bath, we have a model which is already there. And it would be very interesting to listen to Ms. Laman on how a bath has perhaps been uh, supporting the MSMEs uh, in the sense and addressing some of the recommendations that Dr. Golam has already mentioned. Uh, Ms. Laman, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Ali Khan, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to start my presentation. If it's possible, could you let me? Yes, I got it. Uh, due to a time limit, I'll try to keep my presentation as short as possible. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we do. Please go ahead. Okay. About public legal entity run by the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations, uh, established following the presidential decree in 2016. As an acronym from Azerbaijani, ABAT stands for Simplified Support to Family Businesses. 
The main purpose in establishing the organization is to carry out social oriented projects aimed at ensuring the active participation of the citizens in the social economic life of the country, uh, developing micro, small and uh, medium entrepreneurship, raising the employment rate of the population and supporting the formation of competitive family businesses in the country. About implement assistance projects uh, for family businesses engaged in um, handcrafting and food production. Uh, for the time being, the organization administered by its corporate headquarters and represented by its six regional centers, which you can see for, from the presentation, is located uh, in Masale. And um, I'm sorry, yes, in Dalakan, in Guba, in Mishli, and Shaki. Of course, Toulouse too. Also, uh, we have. Uh, for the, uh, for the means of uh, selling our handcrafting products, we have nine ethno boutiques, which are located, five, five of them in Baku, and the other ones are located in the regions. You can see from here, we have a sales point in the um, International Airport, which is located in Duty Free, in Nichari Shahar, in um, Shaki Ceramics and Applied Center, and so on. Uh, we have two ceramics and applied art centers, which is located in Shaki and Nardaran. And by the way, I'd like to say that Shaki was included uh, because of our ceramic center to the European ceramic route. And then uh, we have two Abad schools, which one of them is in Guba and the other one is in Tovuz. Three Abad factories, two of them are located in Guba. One of them is engaged in um, uh, production of um, meat and dairy products, and the other one is soon about to open and is going to be engaged in food product in um, packaging. And the third one is in processing and drying uh, of plants. And uh, for the means of uh, selling our um, uh, food products, we are currently uh, working and collaborating with the big supermarket chains in Azerbaijan, and also um, currently we have twenty seven about in source and stalls which are located in those uh, supermarkets um, you can see from presentation the pictures of it and uh, we have 13 food trucks which are located in several regions of Azerbaijan um, so there are a lot of families in Azerbaijan uh, engaged in areas of handcrafting, agro food production, and supplying the market with their own products. However, experience shows that many families uh, face serious difficulties in delivering their products uh, to a wider range of customers uh, through large retail mm -hmm. uh, chains, big supermarkets, etc. Other obstacles in the successful distribution and sale of products uh, include the absence of basic business, uh, financial, and um, legal knowledge poor product quality, lack of proper certification and marketing skills, and failure to meet customer-oriented uh, design and packaging. Um, then uh, there's a question, um, appears uh, a question that how do we assist families and how our mechanism actually works. Abad operates uh, with a single window principle, which means a one-stop shop principle, and uh, from ideas to shelves uh, motors, which means rendering services uh, from A to Z, and um, how the process starts. If you have an idea, a business idea, uh, you open uh, our official website, which is called About Gobas, and um, you register uh, there and, and you uh, fill in the application form. And um, in, uh, in uh, 15 business days, our team um, workers come uh, back to you, get back to you. Upon positive evaluation, uh, those people are added uh, to the list of prospective ABAD members. And um, we then call them, we meet with them, we interview them and we assess their needs and so on. And after that, we sign contracts with them. Uh, but if uh, the response is going to be negative, then uh, we offer you a consultation with our uh, team members. The main criteria to acceptance of the application is the potential ABAD member uh, should be engaged in either handcrafting or uh, production of food. Uh, the food products they uh, of families must be, um, you know, um, high quality and um, all natural. And um, for the handicrafts, um, it it must be fine work. What happens? As I said, we operate with a um, single window principle, which means we provide um, to a board member uh, the business planning, provision of equipment, marketing, branding and design, accounting, uh, training, legal assistance, packaging, logistics, and of course, in the end, it's um, sales organization. Um, in other words, 
we assist citizens who want uh, to kickstart their business idea um, and uh, get access to the uh, eye-catching store shelves. Up to date, uh, more than uh, 494 um, people, families benefited from about services. And um, currently we are working with uh, 426 of them. As you can see from the uh, presentation, most of them are engaged in decorative uh, applied folk art. And the other one is in uh, food production. Um, since its creation, uh, 5.4 million uh, managed revenue generated from the sales of goods produced by about members and 4.4 million managed of this sum transferred to the bank accounts of about members. And um, currently our team is working um, on a new project, which is called About Guest. And it was uh, created for the need of um, to form rural um, tourism facilities for the tourists who want to move away from the urban environment, uh, eat eco-friendly products and relax in the fresh air. Uh, the project envisages uh, the involvement of about families, uh, their training, partial determination of estimated costs and financing and uh, first of all we're going to implement this project in Shaki region and after that we're going to move forward to other regions and I think that uh, we think that uh, this project um, will uh, help in um, you know uh, in improving the living conditions of the families who are going to uh, to be to take part in this project and we will form new entrepreneurs in the tourism sector and of course we will uh, create additional jobs. Thank you very much. This is all. And if you have any other questions, I will gladly answer them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Laman, for sharing this uh, very good model of Abad, which I, I believe many of the participants today from our member countries would find useful to replicate in how they can support uh, SME sector in a very innovative manner, the way Abad has done it. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, before we come to question and answers, I would move to our third panelist uh, who comes from our very own entity, ICD, uh, Mr. Samer Tagiev. Uh, Brother Samer, uh, we have heard from uh, from our Dr. Ghulam about uh, the government support that can be provided to support uh, the SME sector, especially through the digitization. We have also heard from one of the country representatives on what they have done uh, to, to, to support the SME sector through a very innovative model. Uh, can you tell us the role that uh, MDB kind of an entity, ICD, can play in supplementing the government support uh, to the SME, especially from the perspective of supporting digital platforms? Brother Samir. Good afternoon to all our sisters and brothers and participants, uh, guests. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ali Khan, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, represent uh, ISDB Group Private Sector Development, our ICD, in this webinar. And I'm very happy to be part of this uh, learning uh, sharing platform. Uh, before answering your question, just to make sure uh, our uh, participants uh, know who is ICD, what we do. Uh, ICD uh, established more than 20 years. We are celebrating, last year we celebrated our 20 years anniversary. Uh, we are provided more than $600 million line of financing uh, to SMEs. Uh, I can say that ICD is one of the uh, biggest uh, financier of SME in our member country, including Azerbaijan and all of our Central Asia and Eurasia region. Uh, due to the pandemic, COVID pandemic, we uh, allocated $250 million COVID specific uh, support for SMEs. We are our local strategic partners. Uh, as you know, ICD is working with more than 100 19 institutions uh, and we brought these institutions under one digital platform we call it the bridge platform it will be initiated by end of this year maybe early uh, next year uh, the this bridge platform connects 119 financial institutions from 56 countries so this is the biggest uh, platform which will help smes to access financing to access uh, information. Uh, let's say there's a SME in Azerbaijan wants to do a business with Moroccan businessmen. They want to buy and sell something, uh, but they don't know anyone in Morocco. They don't know the banks in Morocco. So we are this bridge platform. 
they can access to uh, uh, to this information and start the trading uh, cooperation with uh, countries in in our platform. Uh, we also uh, in each country we established uh, leasing companies. Uh, these leasing companies uh, supporting SMEs, uh, the size of business starting from $50,000 up to $3 million, up to $5 million, depending on the size of the leasing company. So we have a leasing company in Azerbaijan, we have a leasing company in Kazakhstan and all in Central Asia region. And in, in my presentation, when you presented me, actually, I'm a board member of in Tajikistan and also in Uzbekistan for the last couple of years. Um, we also support fintech because we believe the future is is uh, is in your Apple phone, and I know uh, even in this webinar everybody is looking to their telephones, WhatsApp, and everything. So we are connected to our apps uh, and our uh, digital platforms. So uh, we announced a fintech award in during annual meeting in Tashkent, which happened in September, and one of the fintech award winners is from Tajikistan. So uh, Alif Bank, uh, the e wallet and other innovative uh, fintech uh, and digital platforms they are promoting uh, in the region. So as ICD, we are big supporter of fintech, big supporter of digitalization. We are the big biggest believer of, uh, of these matters. So uh, I want to thank you, Ali Khan, and, and all of our participants. As ICD, we stand ready. We are your bank. As a shareholder of ICD is 56 uh, Islamic country, including Azerbaijan and other member countries who are participating in our webinar. And uh, uh, my contacts are available in the internet, in different platforms. I will be happy to answer any question from you or from participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Samir, for this uh, very interesting uh, introduction of ICD as well as some of the innovative uh, uh, digitization initiatives that ICD is taking themselves, which uh, which I think is necessary to see and also good to hear about that MDBs are also, are also digitizing, uh, which would enable them to then link with agencies like Abath uh, and also tells us that uh, there are so many potential opportunities for agencies like Abath to partner with the ICD. Uh, uh, based on these initiatives. Uh, uh, I think we just have last two minutes remaining given the time that I had. So I would come back uh, with, the, with the question to Ms. Laman uh, on the Abad model. Uh, Ms. Laman, you have presented uh, the, the, all these innovative features of the Laman model, and I'm sure that many of our countries, they will be interested in replicating some of those. Uh, but based on your experience what do you what do you consider some of the key success factors to make these kind of models work because these are non conventional uh, they are innovative so what would you see as some of those necessary success factors that everyone should keep in mind as they replicate this model Thank you very much. Actually, in my presentation, I, I uh, didn't didn't mention two factors of about services that we deliver to our members. And I think one of the main innovative approach in uh, in, in production is giving them is giving to uh, to about members monoblock containers, which is a total novelty for the people living in regions. Uh, through containers, the production process becomes more efficient, clean, and product uh, reliability increases. And uh, as I said, we have in Guba a factory and in Toulouse also, which is uh, one of them uh, engaged in meat and uh, production of, of meat and dairy products. And the other one um, in drying fruits. And you know, um, those factories are fully furnished with um, cutting edge equipment and families are working there on shifts free of charge. Uh, however, uh, the equipment still belongs to Abad and production process uh, supervised by ABAT technicians. And in case of misuse, ABAT can halt contract with the uh, family. And I think that uh, the other unique model that we have in ABAT is that we provide uh, all the services to the ABAT member. We, are, uh, we want for our members to focus on um, you know, production of the product. And um, uh, we, we uh, deliver them, as I said, uh, branding, uh, marketing to and also we assist them in um, financial accounting, in legal assistance, and also um, we help them with the logistics and the sales of production and so on. 
Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Laman. So perhaps uh, the scale efficiencies, the technical backstopping, which is provided by Abad, and that integrated holistic support services that you are offering, they are perhaps the key, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm looking at the time, and unfortunately, I had a couple of questions uh, from the other panelists, but in interest of time, Brother Ahmed has been after me uh, to conclude it by 11. So I would, I, would, uh, I would thank all the panelists today for this very useful discussion in this session. Uh, and uh, with the, the permission of everyone, I would hand it back to Brother Ahmad. Ahmad, over to you, bro. Thank, thank you, you very so much, colleague. Ali, thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, for moderating this session, and many thanks to our speakers. I think we've had uh, we, we learned about this great example of Abad, and also uh, got the regional perspective, including uh, also from ICD. So many thanks, many thanks to our speakers from the earlier sessions as well. So I think we have. Uh, we're wrapping up this event with a, a very a good re regional perspective on digitalization, e-governance, uh, and also a, a country perspective on Azerbaijan. We hope this has been useful to our guests from Tajikistan as well as uh, the Kyrgyz Republic. And now I will turn it over to uh, uh, our colleagues for closing remarks. We will start with Mr. Riyad Raghab, uh, the Acting Director uh, of the Regional Cooperation and Integration Department of the Islamic Development Bank. He will deliver uh, his remarks and then we'll move on to Mr. Ibrahim Shukri and then Dr. Farid Khan, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Farooq. Salam alaikum, colleague. It's, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to be with you. You know, I will not say that this is a closing remark because I think, I think this is not the end of, 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 of this event. I think this is the beginning of our partnership and I think we're expecting really partnership coming from, from, from the event between, between Azerbaijan and the other countries, and we will be more than happy to go into action after after the this event. You know, I would like uh, to to to, um, to thank, of course, all the speakers from Hassan Khidmat of Azerbaijan, from the Karik Institute, and the Asian Development Bank for sharing their expertise, their research, their best practices on digitalization and e-governance. It was really really insightful. Um, you know, as you are aware, colleague and partners, the importance of digitalization in general and e-governance in particular has been am amplified by the COVID-19 crisis. I think we observed that countries that have developed the necessary infrastructure for ICT prior to the pandemic have far much better in the response to and the management of the crisis. Countries that are behind the curve in this regard do not have the same opportunities. I think beyond, beyond the pandemic, digitalization became, I think, a must. Um, we are saying, I think we should not leave uh, no, no one behind when we are talking about the SDGs, but I think now also we should not leave no one offline. Is 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 the new motto, because if you are not connected, then 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 uh, and you are not online, then then you are you you face more harsh times. Today, in addition to learning from the important work of Carrick Institute and the, the Asian Development Bank, we also got the opportunity to dive deeper into the expertise and know-how of Hassan Khidmat, and I think we are really really proud of that. Um, an awarded winning e-government platform managed by the government of Azerbaijan. Um, at, at the bank, we consider Hassan Khidmat as a resource center, center of excellence, with significant expertise and know-how, which is in a position to advise, support other countries in establishing similar e-government system for the socioeconomic benefit of their citizens. From, uh, from our perspective at the Regional Cooperation and Integration Department, we believe that this expertise must be shared with other member countries through South-South cooperation. To promote such exchange among our member countries, the bank developed the reverse linkage methodology, which is a scaled up technical cooperation mechanisms that allows member countries to exchange their know-how, expertise, and technology through mutual beneficial arrangement. I will, I think, and this modality is available. As I said at the beginning, we are not concluding, but we are starting a partnership between all the, the, the participants that are here. And you have this reverse modality at your disposal to facilitate that exchange and be more than happy as a bank to facilitate that. And I would like to close my remarks by highlighting that all our member countries have something to share with other, with others, regardless of the level of development, through reverse linkage, but also other programs at the bank, the bank remains committed to identifying noteworthy development solution in our member country and facilitating their exchange to achieve the national development, their national development objective, as well as to contribute to the SDGs. 
Um, of course, thank you to all of you. Thank you to my colleagues in the hubs that helped us also in organizing this event. And looking forward now to have um, um, a roadmap and with concrete action to be implemented. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Riyad. And uh, I know you, you had to join very early today because you're on a, also on a mission. So thank you so much for joining us and for spending time with us. And we wish you a fruitful uh, uh, mission as well. And now I will turn over to Mr. Ibrahim Shukri, uh, the head of the Almaty Hub uh, of the Islamic Development Bank, to deliver his uh, closing remarks. Uh, Brother Ibrahim, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ahmad. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, we can thank hear you. you. And again, I would like to, to share my colleagues to thank all uh, colleagues who managed to make this a very successful uh, webinar. Thanks to all speakers, guests, and colleagues. Uh, as we all see today, digital transformation is really critical and important, especially now where we are addressing it to Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to, the, to improve public service delivery and emerge from the COVID 19 pandemic stronger, resilient, and more compatible. Uh, we all agree that the benefits of introducing uh, e-governance are numerous. E-governance can result in substantial revenue generation for the government through a centralized and more efficient collection of fees for certain services. At the same time, transaction costs and uh, inefficiency can go down. E-governance also results in reduced waiting time and costs for the users, individuals and businesses. More convenient, accessible and affordable public services, improve business and improvement of climate, resulting in improved competitiveness of the economy. The bank, as my colleagues Riyad said, is with all the other development partners, stands ready to provide full support to our member countries to build the necessary digital infrastructure and capacity development activities and support national and regional digital development and e-governance initiatives. In conclusion, uh, let me also reiterate that this webinar is the first of a series. As we uh, explained before, it will be followed by a technical session next week between the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations of the Republic of Azerbaijan and the concerned authorities in the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to understand the capacity development needs of their uh, respective uh, countries in digital development and e-governance and based on the outcome of this discussions and the next week uh, session, uh, a reverse linkage uh, intervention may be formulated to benefit from the experience of Azerbaijan through the bank's start house cooperation modality. So again, uh, thank you very much and we wish you to see you next week and uh, wish you a very good day. Thank you so much, for the, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Shukri, uh, 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 for your closing remarks. Uh, I will now turn it over to Dr. Farid Khan, who is the country operations manager uh, of in the Turkey hub. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, before I forget, I would also like to request uh, all of our speakers and uh, you know uh, presenters to turn on their cameras after Dr. Farid is finished, so we can take a, a family photo after uh, you know uh, after his uh, his his closing remarks before we end uh, this event, inshallah. Dr. Farid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother uh, Let me also thank all participants for joining today's event, uh, showcasing the successful experience of Azerbaijan in effective public service delivery. I am confident that the webinar was very useful to provide brief information on the most important dimensions of establishing an efficient e-governance system as shown most clearly by Asan service. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the speakers from the state agency for public services and social innovations of the Republic of Azerbaijan for their outstanding work in ensuring efficient public service delivery, bridging social and geographical divide and making public services more accessible through e-governance system. Today, we learned about their important work in the electronic public service delivery, digital development, promoting innovations, supporting startups and SME development. These initiatives together result in more efficient, responsive, and inclusive public services, which is the core objective of the digital initiative aiming at improved governance. I really hope that the successful model of Asan service will be useful and applicable in the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. The webinar is the first step of a long and successful cooperation of our member countries. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Farid. Uh, and uh, uh, we are wrapping up this event, but this is like, uh, like all of our speakers have said, this is really a start of a new engagement and a new partnership between uh, the Islamic Development Bank, the Karak Institute, the Asian Development Bank, as well as uh, Asan Hizmet uh, and, and Abad and the different services that Azerbaijan is providing uh, on e-governance and uh, support to SMEs. So we hope that next week's event will also be um, uh, important in terms of the technical discussions with Tajikistan and the Kyrgyz Republic. We really thank you for your time, uh, for your engagement. We did go over time a little bit, but I think it was useful and we uh, we really thank you for your patience as well as your, your engagement. So uh, if Ishraq can please help me in taking the, 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 the picture uh, and if colleagues can please turn on your cameras uh, so we can have this family photo before we finish today's session. Uh, Ishraq, let me know when uh, when you're ready. Definitely. We're missing one speaker, I believe. Yes, Mr. Ruslan. And we have Brother Ali as well. So yes. is everyone ready? On the count of three, let's start. One, two, three. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ishraq. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, kind participation and engagement. And we hope to see you uh, next week for the technical discussions with Tajikistan and the Kyrgyz Republic. Have a great day.